We're back for more unsolved case files. We have victim Sandra Ivy, client Astro the fourth, and then we have a case number here. So why don't we go ahead and read the back? August 10th, 2021. I think this is like the most recent as far as it when it occurred, right? The world's first commercial space station, the Delta One, loses power and all communication with ground control for 40 minutes. During the blackout, a mysterious accident claims the life of Sandra Ivy, CEO of Astro 4. So I guess it's Astro 4, not Astro the 4th. The multi-billion dollar space tech company responsible for launching the station. There were five other crew members aboard the Delta 1 and none claimed to know what happened to Sandra while the power was out. Sandra's former chief of secretary, Solomon Hart, was sent skyward to investigate but given only 24 hours aboard the Delta One to make his case. Though it was officially ruled an accident, he suspects there's more to this story than meets the eye. Can you help Solomon find out what really happened to Sandra? So there will be three objectives that we need to solve, and why don't we go ahead and open this up? To be opened by authorized personnel only. I guess that's us. Oh, great. <laughs> Let's try the other side. Oh no! Good thing I brought scissors. <laughs> Usually I like rip it really hard. I want it to be subtle this time. Yeah! <laughs> Let's take out these first. So there's A, B, and C. And after we solve each objective, we get to open one. So we get to put those aside for now. Okay, so first we'll just kind of go through all the documents very quickly just to see what we have. And then we'll probably start digging in deeper. Let's open it up. We have our first objective. Objective one, prove the Delta One was sabotaged. When you find evidence that the blackout was intentional, visit this page. And next we have this evidence folder. It contains photographs relevant to the investigation. Someone didn't do a good job of sealing it. Oh, there is our magnifying glass. Since sometimes we like to scan the documents and put it on the computer, this time we're just going to play it the, with the physical papers. So we'll definitely probably need that magnifying glass. First, we have Raymond Zelik. We have Raj Mandal, a picture of Sandra Ivy's desk. You can see with the name right there. Next. This is Sandra and someone. That photo is in here. Oh, her dad? Oh, there's a note on the back. We'll read that later. Dr. Heidi Bowman, mathematician. It's a picture of a rocket. We also have uh, timestamps, dates and timestamps on these. Uh, some part of the space station, I don't know. The photo itself is pretty dark, so you see what we see. Oh, okay. And then it's her body floating. There's some uh, whiteboard here with other stuff. There's other objects floating. It's another photo. It shows different batteries. Probably something to do with the power outage. And then green sector battery bay. Again, probably related to the power outage. And that's it. Then, photo of Sandra Ivy. Nothing on the back. Have a letter, Solomon Hart Security Inc. This is written to the investigator, which I believe is us from Solomon Hart, who's the guy who went into space to investigate. We have a newspaper article, Space Pioneer Sandra Ivy Dead front and back. And, oh, this folds out. Oh, this looks pretty big. And it's a map or a diagram of the space station on glossy paper. So <laughs> you guys can see it. Um, There's a lot of details here. We'll most likely come back to this once we have more info. Look, there's a recreation center. They're playing, I don't know. Or yeah, something. dev rackets and there's a ball. Next, preliminary accident investigation report. So I'm guessing this will give us a pretty good summary of everything. Next, Solomon Hart Security Inc. case file inventory. So this, I think, is just the checklist to make sure you're not missing any items. But on the back, we have even more detailed timeline. 
All right, now we have some witness statements. This is Raymond Zelik. At least it's one-sided. Raj Mandal, we saw all their pictures and he drew a diagram as well. Back okay. to the green sector ba batteries. Hmm, so this green sector must be important. We have onboard communications transcript. So I'm wondering if this is a very important time when something happened or the last communications we've had. But I don't see Sandra's name. We'll see what this is all about. Manual battery rotation process. Okay, so we have some instructions on what to do with the battery. And here and highlighted down here, right? It says use emergency charge on empty batteries only. Never more than 10 minutes. Someone didn't follow instruction. Definitely keep a note of that. And if you're worried that you can't read these, we're definitely going to try to zoom in later once we actually go through the documents. So don't worry. <laughs> this is a letter, Dr. Heidi Bowman. Hello again, Saul. We've seen that name before. Solomon. Yeah. Oh, Solomon, the guy who went to investigate. And Heidi. Heidi Bowman, we saw her picture too. I think she's the one with the whiteboard behind her. Yeah. Yeah, Dr. Heidi Bowman. All right, now we have our suspects, or technically persons of interest. First up, Amelia Lopez. We have her personal record, which just has more details about her psychological and physical profile, also her medical conditions. I'm sure we'll have this for all the five persons of interest. She measured high on compliance. That's a good sign, maybe? That she follows instructions? Yeah. <laughs> and she didn't sabotage. And then there's an incident report and her interrogation. And there's questions like, is it caused by user error? Oh, she wrote Additional yes. Training. It all had to do with the control room where the battery is located. See, systems damage batteries. So is she the one who reported it? Maybe, she's station commander. I, we'll get into it when we read more. And the last document tied to her is a letter that she wrote, or an email, sorry. This is emails from Dr. Heidi Bowman. And the subject is in-flight medical concern. Hmm. So we'll see what that's all about. All right, next suspect, Jordan Ivy. Oh. It's related? It's not the other person in that photo, right? It's the other person looked older. Uh, in her office? Yeah. No, it was an older white man. This one. <laughs> Sorry, white hair. White hair. So we have this guy who's with Sandra. This person's last name is also Ivy. I don't think it's the same guy. <laughs> that guy looks much older. Okay, let's find out. Let's just see. So also another personal record. Lead engineer. Okay, we don't know who at role Sandra had, at least not yet. I don't see any relations on here, but uh, we'll probably find out. So he also wrote an incident report. He also said, use your error. So again, don't worry when we go through the documents, we'll try to zoom in so you guys can see everything. And then interrogation and request to change station procedures. Purpose, fine-tune the three-unit battery rotation for the red, green, and blue hub battery bays. Interesting. Why would you want to change it? Maybe it was miscommunication. No, this is a murder case. <laughs> Next, we have Hiro Sasaki. So I have his personal record. He is the electrical engineer. He's not that compliant. Oh, does not follow instructions. He's resilient. Mm, that doesn't look good for him. And being an electrical engineer, would you, you know, be more related to the battery operation? Incident report? Caused by user error? No. Hmm, someone's in denial. Or he's very knowledgeable and someone, he said no because he knows it was deliberate. Delib does de being deliberate mean it's a user error? Yeah, like a user caused it. It didn't malfunction on its own. Mm. I don't know, I, that's what I'm guessing. Then his interrogation or interview and <laughs> his social media. Still a few more days left on my low earth orbit vacation. 
<laughs> finally getting to take a peek under the hood. Ah, could something in this photo be incriminating? Our fourth person of interest, Colonel Kurt Abrams. And his personal record, his specialization is classified. Who is this guy? He's military, definitely not a scientist of any sort. He is very compliant, also high in resilience. Those together are good. Okay, okay. You mean they are like firm and being compliant? Yeah, look, he has amazing vision, 20 over 15. Wow. All right, we see his incident report. I guess the, one of the main things we've been noticing is whether they say it's caused by user error. And he says yes. Also his interrogation. And a letter from the United States Space Force. So it's to Solomon Hart from Jerome. Jerome P. Levitt. That's This is Colonel Kurt Abrams. So I guess we'll figure out who that is and why the letter was written to Solomon. And last but not least, AJ Singh. Oh yeah, he's the he's the killer. <laughs> look at that. Look at that. Smoldering look. Look at that necklace. Yeah. Alright, his personal record. He is a spiritual guidance DSM. So what was he doing on this ship? Very low on compliance. High in resilience. Don't know what he would be doing around those batteries, though. Why is he on this trip? To offer spiritual guidance, obviously. Or his incident report, he said, also caused by user error. But no additional training is needed. <laughs> <laughs> He's only concerned with spiritual matters, okay? Look, and he pointed out a different area. Ooh, that's right. We'll have to compare all of these, of course. We have his interrogation. And finally, the Houstonian Times. Is that how you say it? New guru on the block. Yogi breathes new life to Houston's midtown. So I guess he's popular in Houston. All right. Does he have one eye looking at the camera? Oh, he does. I don't Is know, it? I don't know if you guys can see it. <laughs> don't just sleep with one eye open. Meditate with one eye open. And that was it. I guess we might as well just go back to the beginning, go in order. So it's probably a good idea to go over this letter first. Dear investigator, I've never asked for help on a case before. Never had to. Maybe it's my age or my connection to the victim, but there's something wrong here that I can't see. So with tired eyes and heavy heart, I turn these materials over to you. Before I get ahead of myself, my name is Solomon Hart. I led the investigation into Sandra Ivey's death on the Delta One, the world's first commercial space station. You would know Sandra Ivey as the CEO of Astro 4, the multi-billion dollar company that launched the Delta One. I knew Sandra as the daughter I never had. Sandra's dad and I go way back. He was my partner in the Houston PD until he was killed in the line of duty. I couldn't save him, couldn't get there in time but I swore on his grave I'd do anything and everything I could for his family. Sandra was just a scared 12-year-old kid back then, but she was always strong. The legend of Sandra Ivey began well before Astro 4, after her second e-commerce company went public. Her infectious smile and proven track record made Sandra the darling of the business world. She first hired me to serve as her bodyguard on the road, but when Astro 4 emerged a few years later, she made me chief of security. Sandra needed someone she could trust, and I'd do anything to protect her, but just like with her father, I wasn't there when it really mattered. I retired six months before the Delta One's first public voyage, the one that took her life. Raymond Zelik, Astro 4's CFO, pulled me out of retirement to investigate. My mission was to perform a preliminary investigation. It was never supposed to be an open and shut case, but the complete investigation I recommended never happened. I was barely back on earth for 24 hours when I read the news article I've included in the case. They quoted my report completely out of context. It's true I didn't find any hard evidence, but it was far too soon to rule out sabotage. I've shared the case with every rocket scientist I can find. In Houston, there's plenty. And every last one of those eggheads was worthless. I don't need a scientist to solve this case. I need a clever individual who can connect the dots. I need you. Solomon Hart. 
So, I guess we can read the newspaper article that he provided. Space pioneer Sandra Ivy dead. Tragic accident leaves Delta One in the dark and Astro Four founder dead. By Cassia Opia, staff writer for New York News. Houston, the entire world was shocked yesterday afternoon as inaugural visitors to the Delta One commercial space station touched down in Houston one member short. Sandra Ivy, CEO and visionary of Astro Four, was found dead after a tragic accident occurred aboard the company's newly christened space station last Tuesday morning. Two weeks ago, on August 1st, Sandra Ivy was launched to the Delta One along with two crew members and three guests to spend 14 days aboard the luxury station. On August 12th, two days before the crew's highly anticipated return, Astro 4 announced that the landing party would no longer be open to the public and media spectators. This sudden shift toward privacy was explained yesterday morning when acting CEO Raymond Zellick announced that Sandra Ivy had been killed while aboard the Delta One and all celebrations had been canceled out of respect for her family and the harrowed crew. Houston authorities performed a complete autopsy after the body was recovered and confirmed the cause of death as suffocation. This aligned with Astro 4's reports that the automatic fire suppression system activated and removed oxygen from part of the space station. Okay. Mm, the incident. According to Zelik, a sudden system failure disrupted the power across the station and cut off all communications between the Delta One and ground control in Houston. The resulting blackout would not have been immediately critical but a fire within one of the station's three battery networks went unnoticed amidst the chaos until it was too late for Sandra Ivy to evacuate. Reports from the crew tell the story of a frantic sequence of events lasting just over half an hour. I just can't wrap my head around it, reported Jordan Ivy, Sandra's elder brother and the Delta One's lead engineer. I designed that fire suppression system to save lives up there and it killed my sister instead. I can't stop wondering what went through her head stuck in that dark room as each breath became more difficult. She trusted me to protect her, and I didn't. The investigation. In response to the news of their CEO's death, Astro 4 sent private investigator and former Astro 4 chief of security, Solomon Hart, to the Delta One on the same shuttle that later brought the remaining travelers back home. While aboard the Delta One, Hart performed a thorough investigation of the scene and questioned the remaining crew to determine if criminal misconduct was involved, but the investigation revealed no evidence of foul play. Zelik revealed the details of the accident investigation at yesterday's press conference. After a thorough examination by none other than Astro Four's original chief of security, a man who was like a father to Sandra and a man I would trust my, with my own life, it has been determined that this tragedy was the result of an unforeseeable system malfunction. Mm -hmm. The issue in question was easily fixed once it was brought to light, and several new fail-safes are already in place. You have my word that this cannot and will not happen ever again. In his final remarks to the press, Zella concluded with one last near tearful plea. While we cannot reverse the awful tragedy that stole Sandra from us too soon, the survivors at Astro 4 stand resolute to make her vision a reality. We can only hope that the American people will continue to stand with us in that pursuit. Sorry, I'm just, I'm just imagining it's like, beep, beep. <laughs> it's like one tear. Almost one tear. When asked for a statement on any further investigations into the tragedy, Zelik shared the summary conclusion from Hart's report. The death of Sandra Ivy has to be ruled an accident, resulting from reasonable human error. Now I know what Solomon meant. Let's go to the back. Oh, is it part of this or is it um, like another article? So it seems like this is cut off from some other article. So it says mid-sentence, fault has not been assigned and at this juncture, Astro 4 is not entertaining speculation on whether this was the result of faulty construction or criminal negligence of safety protocols by the crew. And then the other <laughs> column here, and the sudden replacement of Sandra Ivy as CEO was not a contingency that Astro 4 had previously planned though Zelik refused to comment whether his interim position could become permanent. Under here, 
There is something about Florida. Florida Panhandle braces for Tropical Storm Fred. According to the National Hurricane Center, Tropical Storm Fred is predicted to gradually increase in strength as it tracks toward the Florida Panhandle on Sunday. A tropical storm warning has already been issued for coastal counties along the Florida Panhandle from Navarre to the Wakula Jefferson County line. Computer models are forecasting the center of Fred to move across the Gulf of Mexico through Monday, then make landfall in the Florida Panhandle near Panama City with expected winds of 60 miles per hour. A storm surge warning has also been issued for the Florida Panhandle coast from Indian Pass to the Steinhatchee River. This means there is serious danger of life threatening flooding from rising water along the coastline over the next several days. Tropical Storm Fred will also bring heavy rains and powerful wind gusts to other areas of the southeast, including Alabama, Georgia, and the Carolinas into the beginning of the upcoming week. I'm sure that's related. I was wondering if it was going to mention Houston. Okay. All right. Let's move on. So here's the preliminary accident investigation report, I believe, from Solomon Hart. Date, August 13th, so that's the day after, and time, 7.33 p.m. Timeline of accident. Tuesday, August 10th, 2021, Sandra Ivy was killed while aboard the Delta One space station. So they didn't report it until two days after that, right? So they were supposed to come back on the 14th. She dies on the 10th, and on the 12th, they make the announcement. Or no, they didn't make an announcement. They just said that they would not be mm -hmm. open to the public and media or whatever. Yeah. All right. So now we have some times and I'm guessing this is all on the 10th. 11, 10 a.m. Station wide blackout disconnects all communication between Delta One and ground control. 11, 20 a.m. Fire starts in the green sector batteries, activating the automatic fire suppression system. And five minutes after that, 11, 25, the AFS systems. So AFS automatic fire suppression. The AFS system seals the green hub from the rest of the station and removes all oxygen. So I'm guessing she was in the green hub. 11.38 a.m. Power is restored and ground control believes Sandra Ivy is deceased in the lab module. So I believe they're referring to this place. The lab module. <laughs> and here you can see they're playing like hangman on the whiteboard. Uh, there's also some glasses floating here. Hard at work or hardly working. Huh? <laughs> and a laptop. The yeah. lab um, module is in the same, is basically where the battery is. Oh, you saw it? Can I just go to a drawing? Control. Like Science lab? What is lab module? Don't so know. we have the yeah we have the green hub and then science lab no. that's the only lab so 1138 power is restored and they believe she's deceased in the lab module 1149 ship commander amelia lopez reports to ground control that sandra ivy is missing wait missing why do they believe she's deceased and she reports just missing oh ground control believes she's deceased mm. why would they believe she's deceased i don't know Okay, anyways, 11.51, the lab module is remotely sealed to prevent interference with the scene per CFO's instruction. So they know she's in there and they sealed it off. And then 11.45 a.m., Lopez obtains visual confirmation through lab door window that Sandra Ivy is deceased. This is the window. Yeah, must be a picture through that window. And it was taken... Oh, this is the next day. This is from uh, Solomon. Persons of interest. Amelia Lopez, former Air Force captain and Delta One ship commander. Amelia failed to account for Sandra Ivy for over 20 minutes, only acting after it was too late to save her. So she just didn't know where she was. Jordan Ivy, Astro Four's lead engineer and Sandra's elder brother. Jordan designed the new battery rotation process and allowed Hiro Sasaki to perform it. An error in this process likely caused the blackout. Hiro Sasaki, CEO of Sasaki Corp and long-standing rival of Astro 4. Hiro was performing the battery rotation that likely caused the blackout. His company also provided the batteries currently used on the Delta One. Kurt Abrams, Colonel in the United States Space Force. 
Kurt was evasive in interrogation, particularly about the cargo he brought aboard the Delta One. He was outside of the station on a spacewalk during the blackout. Mm -hmm. Possible alibi? Ajay Singh, famous yogi and spiritual advisor to Sandra. Ajay secured a multi-million dollar ticket to space mere months after meeting her. He exhibits no sign of grief over Sandra's death, claiming it was meant to be. Wow. That's a little too obvious to be suspicious, you know? All right, preliminary investigation findings. It is believed of all parties that Hiro Sasaki accidentally input the wrong code, setting the full battery to emergency charge, and that this action is responsible for both the blackout and the fire. Ooh. That's a key word, because there's in the instructions it talks about emergency charge. And like, you shouldn't do it. It only, was like highlighted, yeah, right? Yeah, only when it's empty. Yeah. But you did it on a full, full battery. battery. The AFS system was activated by the smoke from the battery and sealed the green hub from the rest of the station before depleting oxygen from all smoke affected areas. This action successfully put out the fire, but resulted in the suffocation of Sandra Ivy, who was trapped inside the science lab. Oh, science lab. Yeah, so it is the lab. one we saw uh, adjacent to the green hub. At this point in my preliminary investigation, the death of Sandra Ivy has to be ruled an accident resulting from reasonable human error. With that being said, it is my strong professional recommendation that the surviving individuals and all cargo returning to Earth be detained within reasonable limits until a thorough and complete investigation can be conducted. Right. So again, this is just a list of the documents, but on the other side, we have more of a timeline. Oh, this is just ordering the documents. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Never seen this before. All right. Next document. Onboard communications transcript between Amelia and Jordan. And Hero. Actually, everyone. Oh, okay. Kurt, just everyone besides Sandra, right? Yeah. Okay, 11.10. So what happened at 11.10? Blackout. The blackout. So this is right after the blackout. So Amelia says, Jordan, we have some lights out in the uh, red sector. Was this scheduled? Please report over. Jordan, we're dark in the control room too. I think the whole station is blacked out. It looks like Hero tripped something on the battery controls. Hero? Why is Hero with you in a restricted area? Over. I, uh, well... This is Hero. I was running this pointless battery rotation because Jordan was too busy for his own busy work today. And then Amelia says, you what, over? The air mixture in the green sector has been off. I was trying to figure out if it was... Will that get the lights back on, Jordan? If not, can we focus on that ASAP, over? Maybe if I knew what Hero did to cause... And then Hero says, Amelia, I followed Jordan's process right off the clipboard Jordan told me to use. Perhaps if he... I had to make that process to fix your batteries. I assume you'd know how to... And then Amelia says, Jordan, let's focus. Is it serious? Over. I don't think so. Our life support systems are all still operational. The emergency power will keep essentials running until we can get the main grid back up. What's the ETA on that? Over. Not sure, Amelia. Maybe if I had some room to breathe in here. And then Hero says, if you want me to leave, just say so. I'm just a guest here anyway. I think he's heading your way, Commander. You'll know as soon as I do about the timeline we're working with. Can you give me a hand in here? And then Amelia says, uh, sure, roger that. I'm in the middle of something, but I'll be there as soon as I can, over. Mm, what is she in the middle of? So basically, Hero is saying that the instructions he followed was Jordan's. But he shouldn't have been doing it, so why did Jordan tell Hero to do it? Because Jordan was busy with something. What was Jordan doing? <laughs> And Amelia was in the red sector? Amelia was in the red sector, and then Jordan and Hero are in the control room, but it's which funny. is a restricted area, sorry. But it's funny that she goes, lights out in the uh, red sector. Like, why would she hesitate, you know? As if she was like trying to think on the spot. She oh. should know, <laughs> she should know every area. I read it as like, Oh, I'm shocked there's a blackout. So it's like, oh, there's lights out in the uh, red sector. 
something. I don't know. Yeah, we're reading too much into this already. <laughs> so it says, calm line empty for four and a half minutes. And then Jordan goes, Amelia, are you almost here? I could use a hand with this flashlight. Affirmative. I'm entering the blue hub now. Over. Colonel A rooms to crew. Over. Oh, this is Kurt. We're here, sir. Sincere apologies for the lights. We're working on it. Over. I've got about 60 minutes of air out here. Should I be worried? Over. Oh yeah, he's uh, doing a spacewalk. <laughs> you have 60 minutes of right, Colonel A room, sir. There was a brief power disruption. Jordan is working on the solution as we speak. We'll repressurize the airlock as soon as we have power. Over. Understood. I saw the lights go out, but couldn't call in for a head count until my hands were free. I'm in the airlock now, but I'll be dead in an hour if you can't repressurize it. You have an ETA? Over. Jordan is running the diagnostic as we speak. We should be in the clear soon, sir. Getting you back inside will be our first priority. Apologies for the wait. Over. Received. I'll await your next report. Over and out. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> that was just scary. Okay, then no comms for another three minutes. So 11.20 is when the timeline of the accident is at when the, f the fire starts at the green sector. So Amelia says, Amelia Tahiro, come in, over. And then she says again, Amelia Tahiro, do you copy? Over. Jordan says, he left his radio in here when he stormed out of the control room. Real professional, huh? He, fine, okay, I'll go find him. Over and out. Okay, hero unresponsive. And then comms are empty for another three minutes and you have 1124 this is right before the afs system seals the green hub so jordan says urgent message to all personnel evacuate the green sector immediately repeat all crew need to leave the green sector immediately now uh over anyone still in the green sector please report over jordan status i have aj and hero here in the red hub i'm heading towards green for a final sweep over no, stay where you are. We've got under a minute before the hatch seals for fire suppression. Repeat, fire suppression, over. Oh, there's a backside. Okay, let's continue. One of the batteries blew in the green hub. Smoking, maybe worse, I'm not sure, but the automatic fire suppression system is now active. Repeat, fire suppression is active. Are you in there now? Do you need assistance? Over. No, just stay where you are. I should be able to get us back up and running once the green hub is sealed off. We can't risk bringing the power back online until that fire is out. We could make it worse. Jordan, I'm at the hatch to the green hub now. It started hissing before I could reach it. I'm only seeing smoke inside. Over. Amelia, get away from there right now. That hiss was the seal activating. The hub is about to get sealed off. We've got to remove the oxygen to make sure nothing's still burning. We can bring the power back after that. Just sit tight and let me work. Roger that. I'll uh, head back to the red sector with the others. Over. This is interesting because how does Jordan know about the batteries that blew up in the green hub if he's supposedly in the control room? Unless in the control room you can see it. Remember there was a picture of the mm. control room? I'm going to assume this is the control room. This is like battery inactive. Oh, yeah, yeah. So maybe this is going to give us something. Well, that's what, yeah, this is what he saw, right? Yeah. Calm line empty for another three minutes, 50 seconds. So we're at 1129. Mm -hmm. Nothing happened yet. Mm -hmm. The power is not restored until 38. Okay. So we'll see what they did. So Amelia says, Amelia to Jordan, over. Jordan says, we're about 10 minutes from getting the power back. We can get Kurt back in then. Should have plenty of time. Jordan, is Sandra with you? Please respond, over. Why would she be in? No, have you checked her room? Maybe she's... And then AJ says, Her path has not led to us, nor ours to her, but the fire has been put out. Yes, I'm sure that... Or she. Oh, I'm sure she... Jordan to Sandra, where are you? Sandra, you need to respond. Over. Sandra. And Amelia says, She can't hear you, Jordan. I found her radio here in her room. How soon can we get into the green sector? Over. Jordan. Uh, like 30 minutes. Amelia. You just said 10. That's for lights and the airlock. The green hub still has to re-oxygenate before we can open it up. And then AJ says, is the entire sector deprived of oxygen, Jordan? Can you see from there? I can barely see anything right now, AJ. 
<laughs> you're saying AJ because I knew someone named AJ. I can barely see anything there right now, AJ. If you could please leave this line open for. Sandra often meditates in the greenhouse. I doubt the fire could have traveled. It's not the fire, AJ. It's the smoke. The AFS system removes the oxygen from every room where it detects smoke. It kills the fire, but nothing could survive in there through the whole cycle. And Amelia says, "Let's not make assumptions too soon, Jordan. There are oxygen canisters in the health center. Sandra is smart. We just need to stay focused and get in there as soon as possible. Okay, Jordan?" Now Kurt comes in, says, "I know what you must be feeling, young man. But on the topic of time and oxygen, I do need to ask you to focus on getting us back up and running. It's the only way to help anyone right now." Jordan, are you reading me? Over. I just, I, I need a minute. And then Amelia says, "How are your O2 levels, Colonel?" I'd say about forty-five minutes left. Over. Take a deep breath, Jordan. I need your head in the game right now. We all do. I'm heading your way to help. Over and out. All right. Finally, calm lines. Thirteen minutes. We're empty. And eleven forty-five. This is after they restored the power. Because the power was restored in eleven thirty-eight. So I wonder why there wasn't any dialogue at eleven thirty-eight. Just curious. Probably we're all busy. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Amelia says, "Commander to all crew, the colonel is safe. The airlock is closed and repressurizing. Our communications back online, Jordan. Over." Yes, and the blown battery has been disconnected from the grid. Oxygen levels are approaching normal in the green hub. We should be able to unseal it in seven minutes. Okay, let's get an update from Houston first. Commander to all guests, meet me in the Red Hub ASAP. We'll report to ground control and get ready to search the green sector as soon as it opens. Green sector bay two, number two is blown up. Hmm, that's the one that eventually got shut down, yeah. shut off. Well, we know how it blew up. It's because someone activated the recharging system or whatever process, and that has to be a manual process. So with unsolved case files. I always ask myself, can we solve it with what we've just been through <laughs> before going through all the documents? What's the question? We have to prove that there was sabotage.、Uh, I don't know if I can prove that. Maybe we should look at that、uh, recharge thing instead of just keeping on going in order. I feel like it's also in the witness statements, though.、Mm. And it's also in the personnel records. And it's in the. Just kidding. <laughs> Maybe yeah. Let's just finish these documents. Next, we have some witness statements. So this is Raymond Zelik, the CFO, as Chief Financial Officer of Astro Four and Acting CEO since Sandra's death. The burden of deciding how we handle this godforsaken tragedy has fallen on me. I cannot emphasize enough how delicate this situation is for Astro Four. We are currently the largest publicly traded company in private space travel, and Sandra Ivy was the face of the entire business and all its endeavors. This was the first visit since the Delta One's completion, the magnum opus of the Ivy name. The world is on the edge of its seat, and if we don't get ahead of the narrative before the press, Astro Force stock will plummet. We stand to lose the whole company, and Sandra's dream of opening outer space to the people will be set back by decades, maybe more. If that happens, Sandra Ivy will be remembered as just another billionaire who flew too close to the sun. We have a shuttle that will be ready to launch two days from now on Thursday. I'm asking you to take it up to the Delta One, find out what happened, and report back to me before you and the others return on the 14th. It's not much time, but this is our only chance to get an independent investigator on the scene to provide an official statement before the press can set their spin. Interesting. It's more like he's telling Solomon what to do. <laughs> the loss of Sandra is truly a tragedy, but it sounds like rogue chance and human error are to blame. I've been assured that the risk of this malfunction repeating itself can be completely mitigated. We need your full due diligence to show that this is not a situation our future guests need to worry about. The entire world has seen you standing by Sandra's side for years, and we all know you'll do what's right. That's why I'm asking you to bring her back home. I have faith you'll do what's needed to keep Astro Four and Sandra's dream in the sky. The success of this mission will define the shape of Sandra Ivy's legacy. It's in your hands now. Wow, that's all he's thinking about. Okay, this is a witness statement from Raj. This is CTO. 
As the Chief Technical Officer at Astro 4, it's my job to make sure the technology within the Delta One operates at full capacity and keeps our crew alive. We receive near instant updates from all of the Delta One's critical systems, and at 11.10 a.m. yesterday morning, it all went dark. For 28 minutes, we had absolutely no contact with the station. At 11.38, the silence is broken by a sudden rush of alarms as chaos filled our mission control room. Things settled quickly, but the medical team remained in a panic as their health monitors re-synced and Sandra's pulse showed a flat line. With limited info, we tried to keep our hopes up, but the mood was grim. That's why they thought she was deceased. I see. Yeah. At 11.49, Amelia finally called in to give us a report. No one had seen Sandra during the blackout and she was presumed to be somewhere in the green sector where the batteries caught fire. We confirmed remotely that her health monitor was in the lab module. That's when Raymond said we needed to prepare for the worst. He ordered me to lock the lab door in order to keep the crew from disrupting the scene. After the green hub reoxygenated, Amelia got a visual of Sandra's body through the hatch window of the lab module and confirmed our worst fears. We will unlock the hatch remotely as soon as Mr. Hart confirms he's ready to investigate the lab. Wait, who's Mr. Hart again? Solomon. Oh, Solomon. That's right. We received no data from the Delta One while the power was down, but the communication system has backup storage like the black box on an airplane. The radios are pushed to talk like walkie-talkies. I have provided the onboard communications transcript for the case file. So what do I believe happened? On August 2nd, Jordan Ivey requested permission to override the automatic battery cycle. He was concerned that the cycle algorithm was running batteries too low before rotating. It wasn't really a critical issue, but it would shorten the lifespan of the batteries and it was important to Jordan, so we gave him the green light. The manual override was meant to be temporary for this mission only, mostly because we only trusted Jordan to perform it. He was going to collect enough data to make the necessary changes to the automation when he returned to Earth. I personally reviewed his proposal along with our lead energy storage expert and electrical systems engineer. We all agreed the protocol was sound and still do, but a clumsy finger can cause a number of problems. We don't usually approve manual overrides because the risk for human error is too great, but we trusted Jordan. He knows the Delta One better than any of us. The same can't be said for Hiro Sasaki. I believe Hiro mistakenly set a fully charged battery to emergency charge. This routed all available solar power to one fully charged battery. An empty battery on emergency charge can fully recharge in minutes. A full battery like the one Hiro sent the emergency power to would overheat almost immediately. This was a grievous mistake, but one that I firmly believe can be attributed to plain human error. Interesting. Okay. Oh, and this is the one with the drawing. So these are similar to the other diagrams we had. Green, blue, red. Mm -hmm. Battery controls mm -hmm. right here, which I think is a picture we saw too, right? Mm -hmm. Science lab hatch locked. Okay. Green sector batteries, which is the green hub, which is right here, right? This is mm -hmm. just a close up of the green. All right, now, manual battery rotation process. Written by Jordan Ivey. Frequency daily at 11 CDT until 8, 13, 21. Purpose, optimize longevity of station batteries until J Ivey can return to Houston and update the Sasaki core automatic battery rotation algorithm. Procedure, step one, rotate batteries in green battery bay. If the active battery is under 40%, Change standby battery to active. Change original active to charge. Change original charge to standby. So you change the status of all three batteries. So what were the statuses of the batteries? So here we can see, I don't know if you guys will be able to see, battery one is currently in charge and battery three is currently active. So, that means battery two would have had to be on standby, which means it would have been fully charged on standby. Basically, they're not supposed to charge that one. <laughs> well, we know it's fully charged because of the explosion. Yeah, right? that too. Okay. 
But I mean, the, the instructions that were not followed then, right? If the active battery is over 40%, no action is needed, which it is also over 40%. It's at 52%. So not only did they not follow step 1.1, they also didn't follow step point two. Well, Hero said, I followed your instructions, according to Jordan. So he according didn't, to yeah. So he didn't follow these instructions, that's for sure. So is there separate instructions written somewhere? Well, it is confusing. For example, it says if active battery is under 40%, then you do these, but it's not. Yeah, so nothing should have been done. And then step two, if active battery is over 40%, no action, yeah. Can I see the comms document again? Mm -hmm. Hero says, I was running this pointless battery rotation because Jordan was too busy for his own busy work today. Why was he running the battery rotation? Who told him to do that? Jordan. He was saying Jordan. But even jo like you shouldn't have done it either. So why did Jordan tell him to do it? Because it happens daily at 11. Ah, there you go. So even though it happens daily at 11, it still shouldn't have been done because the battery was at, or according to this picture, it's at 52%. So Hero says, I followed Jordan's process right off the clipboard. What clipboard? I'm pretty sure the instructions were on the clipboard. Okay, and then here are the codes. They said something about putting a wrong code, right? So keypad instructions for battery rotation, input the location and number followed by star followed by pound and then you just have different numbers to set the different status so 911 emergency charge didn't we say something about emergency charge yeah only on empty batteries never more than 10 minutes but none of them are empty we have to see what code was put in right so basically what you're only supposed to do according to jordan's instructions is that only action is needed if the active battery is under 40%. Yes. That's it. Okay. And there's a keypad right there. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you can see what was inputted. So what should have been done is for the red sector back batteries, not green. Yeah, the red sector is needed to be rotated because the active is at 25%. Okay, we have a letter to Solomon, and this is from Heidi Bowman, who's a doctor or scientist. Hopefully it's not too blurry for you guys, because we're zooming in quite a bit. Okay, hello again, Saul. I gave you the official personnel records, but I felt compelled to share some off the record info on the Delta One roster before you head up there. I'm not sure how forthright Raymond has been, and I'd hate to think we sent you up there blind. So first up, Colonel Abrams. Kurt is a closed book, but he was particularly tight-lipped when it came to the cargo he wanted to bring aboard the Delta One. We asked him to submit an inventory for approval and he pushed back hard. We eventually sent him to ground control since what goes up is really their purview. No idea what happened after that, but there's no record of any inventory for Kurt. And as far as I know, he got to take whatever he wanted. Seems like no one would go through that much trouble if there was nothing to hide. Okay, next one, Hiro Suzaki. As you know, Hiro's company was a fierce rival of Astro 4. Suzaki Corp declared plans for a private space station years ago, but multiple setbacks led to a very public flop around the time Astro 4 announced plans to build the Delta 1. Hiro was a fierce enemy of Astro 4. We know he leaked false rumors to the press, and we believe Suzaki was behind multiple cyber attacks on our employee server looking for restricted info on the Delta One. And I'm sure you recall his campaign to steal our top engineers. Good thing Jordan was getting along with Sandra when he received that offer letter. Eventually, Hiro and Sandra had a six-hour closed-door meeting, and suddenly Suzaki Corp was our top sponsor. He even donated the batteries we installed on the Delta One. Hero is a cunning businessman, and I find it hard to believe his partnership with Astro 4 is as benevolent as he claims. Interesting. AJ Singh. Sandra's wellness guru, AJ Singh, came out of nowhere. He's technically an employee of Astro 4, though the paperwork on that is a mess. No one knows much about him or where he came from. 
Sandra found his book and started attending his practice here in Houston shortly after you retired. I think she was trying to fill a hole in her life that was left by your absence. More on back. Sandra claimed AJ's guidance was critical to making the partnership with Sasaki. A week later, she hired AJ directly and brought 500 copies of his book for our staff. He moved into her guest house and sat beside her every meeting, saying nothing to anyone beyond a whisper in Sandra's ear. Personal advisor is the title they made up, but I have no idea what he does. He doesn't raise any specific red flags, but I often look into his eyes and wonder whether he believes what he says or if it's all just an act. <laughs> his eye, <laughs> the one he kept open. Okay, next, Amelia Lopez. Captain Lopez is the best of the best, and she has had a large chip on her shoulder since being discharged from the Air Force. Her military pedigree is evident, but she ch chafes quickly when dealing with less disciplined teammates. Amelia has always been a bit high strung, but something about this mission in particular has her really uptight. She's even reporting physical symptoms that I think are likely stress induced. I already sent you my last correspondence with her about dietary restrictions, but I'm still not sure what has her so on edge. Well, I did see in her personal record that she has cancer. Oh, now we have Jordan Ivy. I saved Jordan for last because I wanted to be clear that no crew member is perfect. However, Jordan is the only member who was initially rejected for this mission. Jordan's technical expertise isn't in question. He's a genius and knows the Delta One better than anyone. However, he responds poorly in high pressure situations. That's why Raj had to replace him as CTO. Jordan freezes when problems occur, and the more he's pressured, the more prone he becomes to making rash decisions. Jordan is 10 times worse when Sandra is involved. It's clear he feels overshadowed by her in a big way, often blowing small issues way out of proportion. Sandra has a protective streak where Jordan's concerned. Long story short, she overrode our decision and approved Jordan for the mission. Good luck up there, Saul. If anyone can make sense of this, I know it's you. Heidi. P.S. Asher Forest counseling services are at your full disposal. Use them. Talk to me when you're back and we can set up an appointment. I still owe you a favor. Okay, do we know how it was sabotaged? Definitely something with the instructions. Either Hero or Jordan. I can't imagine who else. Kind of wish we could solve it before we dig further into the suspects. Can we just attempt? Is it cheating to go to the site? Why? Because you know like what they're... How many documents they're looking for? Or... No, I think it's fair game. <laughs> this is when you find evidence that the blackout was intentional. Oh, I mean, the process, right, is manual. Well, this is this is good, right? Because this shows us that the process shouldn't have been done. Is it, is it this and the instructions? These two? Sure. <laughs> okay, I'm willing to give it a try because I don't want to go through all the documents before solving the first objective. I think sometimes, you know, we think a little bit too hard. More like every time. So I'm forgetting what it says about the code that was inputted, right? Jordan designed a new battery rotation process and allowed Hiro Sasaki to perform it. An error in this process likely caused the blackout. It is the belief of all parties that Hiro Sasaki accidentally input the wrong code setting a full battery to emergency charge. They're saying accidentally, but I mean, if you follow the instructions correctly, that wouldn't have happened. Saying that he accidentally put in a wrong code, I interpret that as exactly not following instruction. Yeah, yeah, because that's where I saw, right? Uh, emergency charge. So he found out that it was set to emergency charge which is this 911 code. And none of these instructions say to set to emergency charge. So why was, oh, is 911-119? Is that something too? Let me no. see the keypad. The keypad looks normal. You're not supposed to do anything if it's over 40%. I know. <sighs> but nowhere in the instructions does it say to set emergency charge. When do you do emergency charge? When it's completely empty, right? Yes. 
So here's the site to prove the Delta One was sabotaged. Can you prove someone aboard the Delta One sabotaged the station? Pick the two items that prove it. All right, so here's our guess, right? This photo mm -hmm. and the manual or the instructions. Battery sensor readings. Okay, pick that. And manual battery rotation process. Battery process instructions. All, All right. right, here we go. Oh, sorry, those are not the two doggies we're looking for. Oh, but you did get one of them. That means you're onto something. He says, yeah, I looked into that too. Didn't get me anywhere. <laughs> But there's something in the case that will prove sabotage. Just have to keep digging. So which one of these two is right? Is it this one? I hope it's not a document that we haven't reached yet. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. But we do know that we got one of them right. But we're, we're just going to go through the rest of the documents. So another thing we forgot to go back and look at is one of the photos had a note in the back. That's right. It's this one. So that's Solomon, who did the investigation, and of course this is Sandra. My dear Sandra, as difficult as it is to face retirement, looking back, I'm astounded at the wild ride it's been up until now, especially since I don't see you slowing down anytime soon. Thank you for letting me tag along this far, and remember, if you need an old man for anything, I'm only a phone call away. No matter where you are, here to the stars, I'll find a way to be there. Looking over you always, Saul. Now we can get to our suspects. So first we have Amelia Lopez. She also has 2015 vision, just like the Colonel, right? She speaks four languages, one of them sign language, and specialization, test pilot, and shuttle commander. She was honorably discharged from the Air Force. I remember reading that before. Prior orbital flights. This one just stuck out. Green hub installation. Ooh. So she was a part of that team or that work. Again, very compliant. No empathy. Is that bad? Not no. It or just low. scores weaker than the others. A talented and capable leader, Amelia is well trained for her duties as commanding officer and has proven herself resilient to the rigors of spaceflight. My only concern is that she displays a degree of perfectionism bordering on neurotic that may cause friction between herself and less compliant crewmates. Okay, physical profile, respiration is pretty high, reaction very high. Okay, I don't know what uh, standards, she has a six minute mile, that's pretty good. <laughs> You can hold a plank, is that three minutes? Three minutes, 25 seconds. I think she's pretty fit, all right? I think they're trying to say she's pretty fit. She can only do 30 sit-ups. I don't know what the standard is. Well, medical conditions is what you noticed earlier that she put here, a cancer. So, remarks. Breast cancer, diagnosed September 2017. And we are in 2021, or the game is in 2021. Mastectomy performed February 23rd, 2018. Complete remission. Last checkup, July 6, 2021. Next, we have her incident report. So she was in various locations, right? So I guess she did start off in the Red Hub. And oh, these numbers align with this part right here. Mm -hmm. So I guess we can read through that. Incident related injuries, none. Casualties, yes. Caused by user error, yes. Additional training, yes. Caused by mechanical defects, she wrote no. Critical damage, no. Um, parts repaired, yes. Parts needed, yes, okay. Systems damaged, power grid, batteries, thermal controls, and air filtration. Severity of damage, severe. So we'll probably have to compare these with the rest of them. So number one, which is right here, I was in the red sector when the lights went out. Jordan confirmed the outage was station-wide. He and Hero were at each other's throats. Hero had been given access to the control room and the battery override codes. Both are severe breaches of security, and I was furious. But I needed to keep Jordan focused on fixing the problem. Jordan said the situation was non-critical and asked me to head to the control room to help out. So he wasn't supposed to give Hero the codes. No, Hero was just a guest, right? Because mm. they had three guests. 
that means Amelia and Jordan were the only ones who were supposed to like have clearance or something. So Everyone the, else. Sorry, the guest was Hero, the Colonel, and oh. the Guru. I forgot about the Colonel. So two, on my way to the control room, Colonel Abrams radioed in. I was anxious having a man outside like that, but he had enough oxygen, and Jordan had to fix the power before we could get him in. Okay. Okay, and then number three, right here. After a few minutes in the control room, it was clear Jordan was struggling to reverse whatever Hero had done. I radioed Hero to walk us through the, his steps, but he left his radio in the control room, so I headed toward the red sector to find him. So that's why she went back,、mm. I guess. Four. When I got to the red hub. AJ came bumbling out of the observatory, right here. There wasn't time to explain, so I told him to just sit tight. Then Hero entered from habitation, just in time to hear Jordan give the evac order over the radio to leave the green sector. I bolted to the green sector to make sure it was empty, but I was too late. So that's why she goes to the green sector. So why was Hero in habitation? Yeah, he was in the control room, right? I he, think he was supposed to meet her in the red hub. But she, he went to habitation. Unless he passed by hub, the red hub, and was like, "Where are, where are you?" Okay, number five. The door to the green sector hissed shut just as I arrived. Jordan insisted that I shouldn't be anywhere near there, and that's when it hit me like a punch to the gut. Where was Sandra? I rushed back to the red sector and searched every module, but only found Sandra's radio in her room. I called Jordan to see if she was with him in the control room, but she wasn't. So I told AJ and Hero to scour the red sector while I checked the cafeteria, which is back in the blue hub. Which is weird because I guess if Jordan was already in the blue hub, wouldn't you just radio him and say, "Can you find Sandra?"、Yeah. Well, maybe she didn't want to mess or bother him because he was busy. Okay, number seven. The power came back on while I was in the cafeteria, and it was obvious Sandra wasn't there. So next, I went to the door to make sure the colonel was safe, while Jordan got to the airlock ready to reoxygenate. So he, he went to the airlock. Number nine. We had a few minutes before the green sector would unlock, so I asked everyone to meet in the red hub to contact Houston. I thought they may have info to help us rescue Sandra. That's when we found out there wouldn't be any rescue attempts or happy endings. I can't even go in there and get her. Okay,、um, I mean I don't see anything wrong with all that. Next we have her interrogation. Interviewee Commander Emilia Lopez. Location in the cafeteria conducted by Solomon Hart. Commander Lopez, you're the station commander on this vessel, is that right? Yes, sir. I understand that Jordan maintains the integrity of the station itself, while you are responsible for the personnel on board. I suppose that makes you the best person to ask what exactly went wrong up here, right? Yes, sir. There was a station-wide power outage caused when Jordan let Hero into the control. I'll have plenty of questions for Jordan and Hero about the batteries. I need you to tell me how this all ended with Sandra dead. From the start of this crisis. What were you doing to keep her safe, sir? That question doesn't feel appropriate to me, given the complexity of the situation. We had a guest in the airlock breathing on a tank. This radio transcript from Raj shows it took you nearly 20 minutes to even ask where Sandra was. Does that feel appropriate to you, given the complexity of the situation, sir? I was trusting my lead engineer Jordan. He told me the situation wasn't critical and he'd have us back online soon. By the time I knew what was really happening, it was too late to adjust. Let's take this minute by minute. The record shows that you broke radio silence first to ask Jordan what was happening. This was soon after things went dark. Is that right? Yes, sir. Fifteen seconds at most. I didn't know if the outage was isolated to me or station wide. Which he confirmed. What then? I got to the blue sector as fast as I could to assist Jordan. As fast as you could, because it says here that you took almost five minutes to get to the blue hub. I've seen the way you fly down these halls, and I don't see how it could have been more than 90 seconds from anywhere on this station moving as fast as you could. I well, truth be told, sir, I was in the latrine when the lights went out in the red hub specifically. What took you six minutes to get to the control room? With respect, sir, I don't think you want the details. Have you ever been using the bathroom on Earth when the lights went out? Take that experience, but subtract gravity. Add a bunch of vacuum tubes and imagine yourself wearing a one-piece jumpsuit. I appreciate the awkwardness, truly. 
but at the outset of a crisis that threatened the lives of your crew and resulted in the death of your employer, it seems to me that six minutes of your time might have made all the difference. Sir, are you just ignoring that Jordan gave Hero, a guest and one of our direct competitors, full access to our power grid and the codes to do whatever he wanted with it? Or that while they were both snapping at each other, the green sector was literally catching on fire? As I see it, I can't reasonably ask you about any of that because Hero had been gone for nearly six minutes before you even arrived on the scene. I was having stomach issues. It started after we arrived on the station. Dr. Bowman can confirm. I'm aware. You were prescribed a specialized diet and hadn't reported any issues for a week prior to all this, according to Dr. Bowman at least. That all changed the morning of the incident? Quite a coincidence, don't you think? I hate to say it this way, sir, but astronauts are human too. No matter what training you have or how well prepared you are, sometimes you're just out of position when the hammer strikes. Is that all you can say? From what I've heard, nothing can stop Amelia Lopez. Breast cancer couldn't even stop you from getting back to space after the Air Force discharged you. But an upset stomach is all it takes to stop you from saving the woman who got you back up here. Is that a question, sir? Dr. Bowman speculated that your troubles are stress-induced. She thinks the pressure of the mission is getting to you. I'm inclined to agree. What had you on edge that morning? Sir, as you pointed out, the entire crew is dependent on me being at my best. But the dietary plan said no caffeine. None. Sir, I was at four cups of coffee a day when we launched, and now I'm cold turkey. I tried. I had two cups of herbal tea that morning, but it wasn't enough. I was feeling better, so I snuck. I drank some coffee, thought it would help. I was wrong. Even still, I can't grasp your priorities here. What happened after you left the latrine? I rushed to the blue sector like Jordan asked. The colonel radioed in as I was passing through the blue hub. He hadn't made it back inside the station before the blackout. Didn't you know he was out there? I assumed that needed your sign off. That's right, sir, but the colonel has been on a spacewalk every day. I think he'd sleep out there if we let him. So you had a guest outside the station and still decided it was an appropriate time to test your constitution on a cup of coffee? Sir, this is a new frontier for the human race and they sent me here with a skeleton crew and a bunch of untrained, undisciplined civilians. The colonel was the last person I was worried about. At least he knows what he's doing up there. If that's true, then why didn't you worry about any of these undisciplined civilians? By my count, you never even thought about AJ or Sandra until just before the evacuation order. Does that seem right to you? Jordan told me life support was operational, and based on his initial reports, I thought he could just swap out a blown fuse and we'd be up and running again. I'm getting a little tired of you saying this was Jordan's fault while taking no responsibility for your own inaction. Why didn't you at least take a roll call, get a visual, check the other modules for signs of failure? Hindsight is 2020, sir. Could I have done things different? Of course. Could I have saved Sandra Ivy? Possibly. But you weren't here, Saul. I wouldn't expect you to understand. I'm here now, and I still don't understand what you were doing. You want to talk about what I was doing? How much training did you get before they shot you up here? Given the time constraints, I didn't get much past the essentials. But we aren't talking about me here. But you proved my point, sir. Zelix sent you to space without much past the essentials and just expects me to keep you alive in the most hostile environment known to man. I can't even sit on a toilet for five minutes without somebody nearly killing us all. Zelek only cares about media, optics, and shareholders. He doesn't care about any of us up here. Caring for us up here isn't his job, Amelia. It was yours. And you failed to perform it. I'll let you know if I have any other questions. Ooh. End of interview. Burn. He's pretty intense. I wasn't expecting that to be so, like, so tough. All right, next is an uh, email. Should we read this one first? Right, because mm -hmm. the bottom one is the earlier one. From Dr. Heidi Bowman, Friday, August 3rd, in-flight medical concern, to Amelia Lopez, CC Ken W. Bao. Hi, Amelia. After looking at your charts with Dr. Bao, we both agree that it seems like you're experiencing an intense bout of IBS. This is likely a symptom of the acute stress surrounding this mission or the progression of a developing dietary sensitivity. None of your other readings suggest viral infection and none of the other crew are experiencing issues, so we don't think it's food poisoning. We advise that you increase your fiber intake from fruits and vegetables and avoid any foods containing lactose, gluten, or heavy spices. Drink mostly water and avoid excess caffeine entirely. Yes, that means you need to eliminate coffee 
even decaf, until this stabilizes. We know the latter request may be particularly difficult, but you are in luck. AJ Singh requested a supply of teas be sent with his personal effects. If he is willing to part with some, it should be enough to get you out of a morning slump without being too taxing on your digestion. To be on the safe side, I'd like you to stick to this list of approved foods for the remainder of the trip. I know it's not as appetizing as the pre-made meals, but we need you to feeling at your best for everyone's sake. I've included the inventory codes so they're easy to find in the cafeteria. So let's split up between starch, protein, fruits, nuts, rice, oatmeal, quinoa, sweet potato, there's some chicken broth, chicken soup, tuna, salmon, pumpkin seeds, dried bananas, dried blueberries, and dried oranges. So she wasn't supposed to drink coffee, but she did. <laughs> she snuck some coffee and she thought it would help. I was wrong. But I also want to take a note that she had two cups of herbal tea and it's in quotations. <laughs> so I don't know what that's all about. All right, so now the response. Oh no. Heidi Ford said Sasol. Hi Sol, please find my correspondence with Amelia below regarding her dietary restrictions. They did mention a lot of the timelines and that at least Saul believed things were questionable. But I kind of understand, right? It's dark and it's hard to move around. I guess I don't know in the in the context of space and how close, like I don't know how close each hub is. So when he says five minutes, I'm thinking like you have to go to a different wing completely. But I guess he says you should have been there in like 90, 90 seconds. seconds or something. Yeah. All right, Jordan Ivy. So he has 2100 vision which I guess that's why he has glasses. He's the lead engineer. He was involved with test flights. Don't know what else sticks out here. His clearance level is crew. I'm guessing the other ones will be like guest. And here we see he has high compliance, low resilience, low stability. A highly conscientious and brilliant engineer, Jordan is easily flustered when the world does not share his compliance to expected outcomes. This makes him a questionable choice for any mission where he may be a lead decision maker in a high stakes scenario. He is prone to making rash decisions or no decision at all when presented with unexpected obstacles that require fast action. Okay, physical profile, slow reaction. See, his push-ups are 16, whereas Amelia can do 23. And he can do 25, Amelia can do 30. Yeah, she's way more fit. Okay, she's definitely fit. So he's not the most um, fit fit person, yeah. Plank hold 19 seconds? What? <laughs> I can do longer than that. Medical and conditions, he just has anxiety. Diagnosed but not medicated. Mild generalized anxiety disorder. No reported history of panic attacks. Incident report. Whenever they do like these custom fonts that are supposed to look like handwriting, it's so hard to read. Well, it's only hard because like we're trying to film everything. All right, so he noted some places here, just the control room and the blown battery. Related injuries, he put no. Casualties, yes. User error, yes. Additional training, no. Mechanical defect, no. Damage sustained, no. Parts repaired, no. Replacements part needed, yes. That's weird. And they said only the batteries were damaged, which I guess is true. It's very different. Yeah. Very different. I was working through an air filtration issue from the control room when everything went dark and the emergency lighting kicked in. Hero was in there with me. I left him at the battery controls just a few minutes prior. I knew he did something wrong immediately. The battery controls is in the control room. Mm -hmm. I asked him what happened and he just stared at me. Like he couldn't fathom that he might be at fault. Amelia radioed in, so I knew the main electrical grid must be off. Essential systems were still on emergency power, so it didn't feel life-threatening. I asked Hiro to walk me through what he did wrong, but he got flustered and stormed off. Would have been helpful to have him there, but I didn't have the time for his attitude. I asked Amelia to assist, and it took forever for her to get down the hallway. So I was on my own trying to hold a pen light in my teeth. Colonel Abrams called in. That's when we both realized that he was still outside the station and we couldn't let him in until the power was back on. By the time Amelia arrived, it was clear we needed Hero to tell us exactly what he did, but he left his radio in the battery cabinet when he pushed off. Amelia headed out to find him. A minute or two after she left, I noticed that the air quality monitor was in the red. 
we had smoke in the green hub and the fire suppression system had already triggered. I got on the radio and gave the evacuation order as soon as I realized what was happening. Amelia ignored the part about evacuating and decided to rush towards it instead. I'm just glad she wasn't inside when the hatch sealed. She asked if I knew where Sandra was, like it wasn't her job to know. But I guess that job fell on me too, and I failed. I got the power back on about 10 minutes later. A few minutes more and we had the colonel safely inside. After that, Amelia made us call ground control before heading into the green sector to find Sandra. Now they're saying you'll be the first one they let in to see her. They let in, oh, he's talking to Solomon. So he, I guess, realized too that it took Amelia quite a bit of time to get to him. He says that he asked Hero, basically walk me through what happened. And then says that he asked Amelia for assistance. And then by the time Amelia arrived, um, they still needed Hero to tell, tell them exactly what he did. Is that true? I know they tried to radio Hero. Okay, so Amelia went to the green hub without telling Jordan. So he gave out the evacuation order, but Amelia ignored the part about evacuating and decided to rush towards it. So she went to the green hub. I don't remember that part. Well, she mentions it in her incident report. That she just went to the green hub even though he said to evacuate? So she actually finds Hero in the red hub. And here's Jordan give the evac order of the radio to leave the green sector. To leave it, not before. But then she says, oh. I bolted to the green sector to make sure it was empty. I see. So is that suspicious that she bolted to the green sector? I don't know. As if she knew she was in there? Okay. All right, well, let's just move on. Okay, so interviewee is Jordan Ivy. It's good seeing you again, Jordan. I wish it was under different circumstances, but... You're here to ask me questions about the accident, right? Right. On to business then. You're the lead engineer up here. Why don't we start with what went wrong? Best I can tell, rather than rotating the batteries, Hero set the standby battery in the green sector to emergency charge. Standby batteries are always topped off, so it overloaded in minutes. We got a huge power surge after it blew, and that's what knocked out the grid. That lines up with Raj's assessment. I understand you came up with this battery process after arriving here on the Delta One, is that correct? Yeah, I noticed the batteries in each sector weren't rotating efficiently. Each sector has three batteries, one active, one charging, and a full one on standby. Sasaki Core designed them to automatically rotate after the active one drains, or the charging one gets full, etc. But it was letting the active battery get as low as 5% with two full batteries sitting idle, which is ridiculous. And so you decided to override it manually. Is that a standard solution? It was only supposed to be for this trip. This is my first time kicking the tires on the Delta One in her natural habitat. She behaves a little differently up here than the test model we have in Houston. My plan was to observe and take notes so I could reprogram the algorithm when I got back. So this was a correction to the Sasaki Corp algorithm. Is that why you had Hero running this process? Not exactly. He gave me an earful every time my battery adjustments came up until eventually Sandra stepped in. She proposed that we let Hero run the manual rotation once as a professional and partner to weigh in on the changes needed to the automation. We can all see how well that went. Does Sandra mean for him to do it on his own with no instruction or supervision from you? I already wrote out the instructions plain as day. I even highlighted the part about not setting the batteries to emergency charge. If that wasn't enough to get Hero to pay attention, what could I have said to him? So you didn't show him anything and just set him loose on the station's main power source? You say it as if I left a toddler with a hand grenade in a china shop. Hero designed those batteries. He's not a layperson, and I wrote a step-by-step -step guide. Same guide I followed myself for a week with no issue. Everyone at Ground Control also read it and signed off. We designed every bit of the electrical infrastructure on the Delta One. Everything except those batteries. That is true. Hero was a guest on the station, not its technician. And beyond that, you know he used to be Astro 4's biggest rival. What were you thinking letting him loose in there if it was this easy to cause problems? I was thinking that I have enough to do around here trying to keep us in orbit, keep the water clean, and I don't know, make sure we have air to breathe. Air to breathe, huh? The station and the lives of its crew were your responsibility, Jordan. It seems to me like you put that at risk for what? Pride? Pettiness? 
Those batteries arrived with Suzaki's logo on the box, but they became yours the second they were installed on the Delta One. This is your station, Jordan. Oh, it's my station when it starts falling apart? It's Sandra's face on all the promo posters, but it's going to be my mugshot on the front page of the newspaper when it all blows up, is that it? Unfortunately, I think it's going to be your sister's face on the front page for this one too, Jordan, but not in a way anyone wanted. I know you and she had your differences, but- You can cut it there, Sol. I don't care how close you think you were. She was my sister. I don't need this from you. I don't need this from anyone right now. How many times do I have to say that this isn't about you? You have this chip on your shoulder ever since you and Sandra went into business together and- Is that what we're calling it? We went into business together? It took me decades of blood, sweat, and tears to make this possible, and the dream bankrupted me more than once. And yet, when people hear the name Astro 4, all it... Oh, you know something I just realized? Right. It's also Astro IV. 4. <laughs> the IV, what? like IV. Oh. Are we reading it wrong? Sandra named the company IV after both of you. <laughs> Oh man, okay, it's supposed to be IV. <laughs> uh, whoops. It was supposed to be the culmination of your engineering genius and her business savvy. She was inspired by how hard you worked to make your dreams happen and didn't hesitate when she saw a chance to help. Sandra told me so many times that the two of you were unstoppable together. I know how she felt, but do you know how hard it is to grind yourself to the bone and still end up with empty pockets while your little sister's on the cover of Forbes? You're glossing over the part where your last startup folded so hard you had to move back in with your mother. Doubt she told you, but I helped her box up all your old transformers and peel the glow-in-the-dark stars off the ceiling so you didn't have to feel like a child running back home. It was a setback, Saul, and I bought that house as soon as I got back on my feet. I needed a place to live in Houston and mom got to retire in Florida like she and dad always wanted. Don't try to paint it like a charity case. I get knocked down, but I get up again. Well, I guess you'll have to get up again by yourself now. Hope it's all you expected. I'll let you know if I need anything else. That must be weird because they know each other, right? And then he's interviewing him. All right, here is his request to change the procedures. So requester, Jordan Ivy, August 2nd. Purpose, fine tune the three unit battery rotation for the red, green, and blue hub battery bays. Details for consideration. Notice the automated battery rotation for the battery bays in each hub isn't operating efficiently. I'd like to manually override it while I'm up here and collect enough data to fix Sasaki's algorithm when I get back to Houston. These batteries should be kept above 40% charge for optimal lifespan, but the default programming wears the active battery all the way down below 5% before rotating. So that means that the one we read is his updated one. I went ahead and wrote up the instructions and attached it to this request for approval. Can you double check these override codes are all up to date? Systems affected, sector batteries, solar energy diverters, special tools needed, keypad with hardwired USB-C. Proposed start date, August 3rd for 10 days. So it was during that trip. The attached file is the instructions that we read and they all signed off on it. All right, now we have Hiro Sasaki. He's probably the most suspicious at this point. <laughs> so he resides in Tokyo, 2020 vision. He speaks Japanese, English, Mandarin, and German. Cool. Electrical engineer and his clearance level is guest. He did a suborbital flight test, but with the Sasaki Corp. Low compliance, low empathy. Hero is talented and capable and consummate and experienced businessman with high ambitions. His background as an entrepreneur shows that he is a natural leader with the ability to follow through on long-term goals. However, Hero's natural inclination towards leadership may lead to disgruntlement when he is not in a position of authority. Long-term goals could be to destroy <laughs> Astro Ivy. I was wondering like what she told him to get him to agree, remember? It's weird. And then suddenly he's the main sponsor. <laughs> Alright, his physical profile. A little bit better than Jordan, so I don't know, not not athletic, but not bad either. <laughs> Medical conditions, allergies, remarks, shellfish. Okay, so he notates battery controls and he also noted, notates where his room is. So I think all the rooms are in habitation, right? And then that's where Amelia found him. Okay, so the incident, um, he wrote, located in the power distribution. 
Incident related injuries, no. Incident related casualties, yes. Caused by user error, no. <laughs> no. Okay, additional training needed, yes. Reasonable. Caused by mechanical defect, no. Critical damage, yes. Parts re repaired or replaced, no. Replacement parts needed, yes. Systems damage power grid and batteries, and the severity is critical. Kind of matches more with Amelia. So he says, I was in the control room running Jordan's needless battery rotation process. He couldn't trust our batteries to do their job without putting his name on it somehow. I followed Jordan's process to the letter, but I was only a few minutes in when it all went dark. Jordan was fuming. He immediately blamed the issue on the batteries and then my inability to follow instructions. We determined that our essential systems were still working and I left when it became clear that he would rather cast blame than work to fix the problem together. After that, I went back to my room to let the professionals fix it. My radio must have detached from the Velcro because Amelia came into the red sector hub yelling for me. I came out of the habitation to meet her as soon as I heard. Before she could get a full sentence out, Jordan called over her radio asking all crew to evacuate the green sector. Amelia immediately launched herself towards green sector, leaving AJ and me stranded in the red hub. A few minutes later, she returned asking if we had seen Sandra. We had not, so we split up to check all the rooms and other modules in the red sector. When we failed to find Sandra, Amelia radioed Jordan to ask if he had seen her anywhere in the blue sector. When he said he hadn't, I think that's when it sank in for all of us. We tried to remain optimistic, mostly for Jordan's sake. He and I had our differences, but I can't imagine the way he must have felt as the minutes ticked by with no word from Sandra. Jordan eventually brought the main power back online. Once the colonel was safe in the airlock, we met in the red sector hub and received confirmation from ground control that she didn't make it. That kind of lines up with what everyone else is saying, except we know why he went back to his room because he was like trying to just get out of their way. <laughs> Interviewee Hiro Sasaki. Mr. Sasaki, thank you for joining me. Do you prefer Sasaki-san? Hiro is fine, but I thank you for asking. Hiro, thank you. You can call me Saul. Now I'll cut to the chase. You are running the battery rotation that everyone is saying likely caused a power outage. Is that correct? Yes, I was. And I am not surprised that is what everyone is saying. Do you believe your actions might have contributed to the blackout? I believe that the battery rotation was automated for a reason, and Jordan insisting we override a complex and meticulously designed system in the name of a fractional percentage of efficiency endangered the entirety of the Delta One crew. I see. Sasaki Corp provided the batteries in question. Did you also write whatever program was being overridden? Yes, the staff of worldwide experts at Sasaki Corp did. We are one of the most prolific electronics distributors in the world, yet Jordan Ivey can't tolerate anything on the Delta One without his fingerprints all over it. That brings me to my next point, actually. Jordan ran the same rotation process for a week with no issues. You have a formidable resume and arguably should be the foremost expert on the system we're talking about. Forgive me, I will interrupt you there. I didn't install the batteries on this station, nor did I design the protocol used to override them. This is Astro IV's vessel, not mine. Not for lack of trying. You've been trying to take over Astro IV ever since the world started taking them seriously. Sasaki Corp made many previous attempts to acquire Astro IV and the plans to Delta One. That much is true. But we've recently changed our approach to one of partnership. I believe the saying goes, if you can't beat them, join them. Is that how you put it? That's right. You may not know me, but I was chief of security at Astro IV while you were still trying to beat him. Now you're trying to play nice. What changed your mind? Sandra IV changed my mind. I see the picture you're painting here, detective. A portrait of corporate sabotage from a business rival. Before we both say something regrettable, I assure you that I am first and foremost a businessman, and having my technology at the heart of this disaster isn't good PR for Sasaki. That's true. Bad press can be overcome, but Sandra's loss is a death blow to Astro Ivy. A wise businessman might be willing to break a few eggs to make a hostile takeover omelet. I held Sandra in the utmost respect, something you clearly don't have for me. If there was anything I could have done to prevent this from happening, I would have. Really? My reports indicate that you abandoned the one place you might have been helpful as soon as the problem started and left your radio behind so that you couldn't be reached. I'll admit. I reacted poorly when Jordan was pointing fingers. 
I told him numerous times that we shouldn't be doing this override in the first place. So how did you end up doing it yourself? Jordan was constantly complaining about the need to babysit my batteries. It was very disrespectful to me as a guest, as an engineer, and as a partner to Astro IV. Eventually, he and I had it out vocally enough that Sandra and AJ suggested I should see for myself. And did you? Did you see what Jordan was talking about? I think we can all agree now that the risk far outweighed the reward. The station was running fine before Jordan got here, and you'll notice that even with one battery out of commission, we haven't had any other problems since he stopped interfering and let the default algorithms from Sasaki do their work. There only seems to have been an issue with the override procedure while you were at the controls. Jordan's protocol seemed to work fine before that, and the ground control signed off in, on the whole thing. Did he give you a walkthrough? He barely told me where to find the control panel, just pointed at a clipboard and left me on my own. I've also never been given an overview of the power infrastructure for the Delta One, despite asking numerous times. Do you think you could have done something wrong? Respectfully, is that a real question? Yes, I agree with Ground Control's assessment that something went wrong during the rotation process that resulted in an overcharged battery, but I followed those directions to the letter. I believe the fault is with Jordan for trying to fix what wasn't broken with some half-baked procedure. So you agree that you may have caused a blackout and then you immediately left the scene without your radio? I left the scene without my radio and I was at the battery controls when the blackout happened. But I do not- You have the most electrical systems knowledge of anyone on this vessel and you left the one area that might have been useful. You can see why that's suspicious, right? The gravity of the situation was not apparent to anyone at first. It was dark and I was upset. I must have set the radio down or perhaps it became detached by accident. I'm sorry to hear that you were upset. I still find it hard to believe a man of your intellect storms off, leaving everyone on the station in the dark. I've been condescended to enough by the Astro IV staff without you adding to the list. Is that part of your formal training? You can leave us a bad review on TripAdvisor when you get back to Earth if you want. So where did you go when you left the control room? To my room and habitation. It seemed as good a place as any to sit in the dark. I wasn't there long before Amelia arrived. Did you see Sandra at all or AJ? AJ was there when I came back out into the Red Hub to meet Amelia. But the last time I saw Sandra was maybe 30 minutes before I left to meet Jordan in the control room. She apologized for Jordan's attitude and thanked me for agreeing to humor him. Okay. She was protecting my ego, I knew that. But she was a gracious partner and I am sad to have lost her so soon after making amends. I'll be in touch with any other questions. Send the colonel in if you don't mind. Wow, that's the first time we heard like her whereabouts. So he saw her oh, yeah, 30 yeah. minutes before he left to meet Jordan in the control room. Which would be at like 10.40, right? Because they started at 10 or 11.10. 10.30, 10, 10.40. 10, 10, All right, here is his social media. Let's read this top left one first. Sorry, yeah. Oh, you can. Oh! He has a clipboard. He has a clipboard. Oh, look! I found something. What? It's not highlighted. <gasps> It's a different sheet. Oh, I gotta look into that. Oh, we need the, the magnifying glass. <laughs> or just, we'll just look closely. <laughs> All right, this just seems like uh, very generic stuff up here. Don't think you really need to read this. I'll zoom in if you guys want to pause and read it. Now let's go over here. Still a few more days left on my low earth orbit vacation, and I'm finally getting to take a peek under the hood on the Delta One. This might not look as fun as the Delta One Zero G rec center, but it's the most exciting stuff on the station to me. This is August 10th, around right before 11. You can pose from space? Amy Cooper says, how much did it cost to get on this roller coaster? All right, now let's go see what's on this uh, clipboard. I guess that's enough evidence though, right? We don't need to see if the words are different. It is a different sheet. Is that enough? Oh, it's, com it's completely different, actually. Just look at the the length of text here. The, the first one is the longest one, and the last. Can you see it? I pointed this out earlier. It basically, if right these here. two are switched, it was like nine one one and one one nine. Yeah. So this phrasing is the longest line in this paragraph. Yeah. But if you look here, the longest line is the first one. 
So basically he was trying to set a battery to active, but put in the emergency charge uh, command because it was wrong on this sheet. I think we have enough to solve the first objective. The instruction is that you're not supposed to do anything actually. Let, let me see those batteries again. So I know we were trying to read off of these percentages. All of this happened on the 10th. So this is three days later. So I guess these numbers aren't really, uh, we can't really rely on these numbers to tell what the status was at the time. We just know that he was trying to set a fully charged battery to active, but had the code to set to emergency charge, which caused the whole situation to arise. So you guys have already seen this, but this time we're going to pick the battery process instructions and his social media page, Hero's social media post. All right, here we go. Ding, 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 ding. You solved objective number one. Someone swapped the battery rotation instructions. Congratulations, you just broken the entire case wide open. You may now open bonus envelope A. So all this stuff is exactly what we pointed out already. Now let's open bonus envelope A. All right, here we go. All right, so we have objective two. Prove the fire suppression system did not kill Sandra. <gasps> it was the T. When you could confirm Sandra was not killed by the automatic fire suppression system, visit this web page to prove it. All right, let's read this letter. Thank you, investigator. You've cracked this case wide open. Your discovery raises several new questions. Why was there a fake version of the battery instructions in the control room? Who made it? Who put it there? Why? At least some of the mystery is unraveling. It never made sense that Sandra would have stayed in the lab for 15 minutes after the lights went out. The Sandra I know would have gone to Jordan before anyone else and helped him fix the problem. I'm convinced Sandra was already dead when the blackout happened. Why would someone risk their own life sabotaging the station unless they desperately needed to create a distraction? There's no evidence Sandra was bound or locked in the lab, so it's the only explanation that makes sense. I just can't prove it. I contacted the USSF now that we have proof of foul play. They're under a lot of scrutiny right now and can't afford a public connection to Sandra's death. So I leveraged that to get more info on Colonel Abrams' personal cargo. It should come as no surprise that Kurt was up to something. The USSF swears it had nothing to do with the accident, but I don't know. They claim Kurt was sent to test an experimental drug in zero gravity and to scope out the Delta One's technology. I can't see a connection, but I'm sending you everything they sent me. I know in my gut, Sandra was already dead when that fire suppression system turned on. Will you help me prove that the fire suppression system wasn't the real culprit like everyone says? Please don't give up on us, Solomon Hart. P.S. I've included a clipping I think you'll find interesting. The members of the original Delta One mission met up recently to dedicate a new building for the Ivy Institute at Sandra's alma mater. They've all been quite busy since the accident. So here's the newspaper clipping. Ivy Institute opens first lab in Houston. Surviving members of the Delta One tragedy dedicate new lab building to Sandra Ivy. The Ivy Institute of Aerospace Engineering opened its doors to a new cohort of starry-eyed Rice University students yesterday. The institute was funded by a trust left by Sandra Ivy, a Rice alumnus well known for founding Astro Ivy, launching the first successful private space station and for her tragic death during the Delta One's maiden voyage. A memoriam of Sandra Ivy's achievements and sacrifice, the surviving crew reassembled to dedicate the building in her name. Jordan Ivey, Sandra's elder brother and current CTO of Astro IV, shared a few heartfelt stories about life growing up with Sandra and what it was like going into business with his little sister. Standing next to him was the new Astro IV CEO, Hiro Sasaki. To anyone in the tech world, Sasaki is a household name, and many may remember him as a rival to Astro IV. However, as Sasaki explained in his dedication speech, rivalry is born from deep respect for what the other might accomplish, as he vowed to carry on Sandra's vision. Major Emilia Lopez, the ship commander for the Delta One, was also in attendance alongside Colonel Kurt Abrams. Major Lopez, who left the Air Force to join Astro IV, has since re-enlisted in the USSF 
and is currently serving as a liaison promoting cooperation between the USSF, NASA, and private space ventures like Astro IV. AJ Singh, not pictured, was unable to attend. After the Delta One tragedy, Singh opened a remote yoga retreat in Northern Oregon with a strict digital detox policy banning all connected devices. According to the event coordinator, Mr. Singh never replied to the evite. Maybe he was upset because uh, Sasaki posted the social media thing that we found. You know what I noticed before you turn over? The Rice University stuck out because it was in um, Amelia's background. Yeah, they're both alumni. They're both alumni? Sandra Ivy, a oh, Rice Sandra, alumnus. Sorry. All right, let's go to the back. My hope is that we never hear another story like that ever again, said General Le Oh, this is like a different article, right? My hope is that we never hear another story like that ever again, said General Levitt, when discussing his personal motivations for constructing the Commercial Space Security Amendments Act being passed in front of the House of Representatives early next week. The bill would secure the right of the United States Space Force to appoint and train special officers, colloquially deemed space marshals, to be present on all commercial space stations 24-7 to provide security and to serve as the acting legal authority aboard the stations. The General's urgency for this legislation to be passed is clear as Astro IV presses forward with plans to launch additional Delta Series space stations within the next year. Okay, could this tie to the Colonel's uh, motivations? How? <laughs> they wanted to get this program also. As security? For Space Force, the US Space Force. Then there's some movie poster starring, you said Jennifer Hudson, <laughs> <laughs> Natalie Portman, Kevin Hart, Harrison Ford. I don't know his name, but he's from Inception and the guy from uh, Slumdog Millionaire. <laughs> Was it shocking for you that the CEO's hero? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and that Jordan became CTO again. Now we have a decision to make. Do you want to continue reading what was in envelope A or go back to our suspects here? Envelope A. Okay. So this is classified, top secret. So this was certified by General Levitt. Confidential Operation Mighty Mouse. Mission Summary. Oversee a top secret scientific experiment on behalf of the USSF within the microgravity environment of the Delta One space station. Background details. The USSF has developed a new supplement for astronauts. B90X. <laughs> B90X. <-X. laughs> Is it a workout program? I don't know. B90X is designed to prevent the loss of muscle and bone mass in zero gravity. B90X is still highly experimental, but we believe it could enable our plans for a permanent USSF military force in outer space within this decade. Wow. Necessary materials. The experiment will occur inside a battery operated habitat, MH908, for two rodent subjects. The habitat has an automatic feeder, regulated water supply, and automatic light and temperature controls. The unit is odor controlled to prevent suspicion, but must be kept uncovered to allow fresh air intake and exhaust. The unit cannot be stored in unpressurized cargo areas while traveling to and from the Delta One, as it is not pressurized and does not have its own self-contained air supply. Primary objective. Your primary objective is to keep the apparatus safe and undetected while maintaining the requirements for the habitat to function. The internal enclosure is locked and you will not be provided the keys to access the rodents. In the event that a rodent dies or suffers other adverse effects, you have no responsibility nor the capability to intervene. The unit itself will automatically record all data needed for the experiment. We've made everything as hands-off as possible to ensure the secrecy of the project and the accuracy of the results. Didn't they say there are two rodents? Yeah. So what if one... That's sad. They can't do anything, I have to leave it there. Under no circumstances should any member of Astro Ivy be made aware of this mission. Refer all civilians unfamiliar with the definition of confidential to General Levitt and he will ensure they are made aware of their clearance level. General Levitt is the one mentioned in here too, mm -hmm. who wanted to push for this space marshals. 
Secondary objective, collect as much data as possible from the Delta-1 itself during your stay. Astro IV has kept the inner workings of the station a closely guarded secret despite building off the work of government agencies like ours. Okay, there's a little bit of animosity there. You may not be alone in this endeavor. Our intelligence team has found similar information for sale on the dark web, indicating a high level infiltration within Astro IV. There are several international corporations and nation states who would pay billions for the plans to the Delta One. Mission failure. In the event of the critical breach and security resulting from this mission, the USSF will categorically deny any knowledge of the development of B90X or your involvement in its experimentation. Next we have the other letter from the envelope. The text is really small. Um, <laughs> this is as close as we're gonna get, so we'll try to read it clearly. Effectiveness of B90X at reducing muscle atrophy in rodents in a zero gravity environment. I don't know if we're really gonna go through all of this, but let's just see. Oh, so they had two because subject one was given no access to B90X and subject two was given a separate food supply blended 10% of B90X. It's funny because I imagine like rats going like, who, 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 who. <laughs> so what is this chart? A uh, body mass? Yeah, so it says subject two stopped the expected muscle loss and showed radical potential as a muscle growth stimulant. So the first one was losing body mass, the control, mm -hmm. while subject two was getting beefed up. <laughs> and then it shows here too. So this is one pre-trial and then two lost weight. This is in grams. The second, <laughs> even the picture looks so, so buffed up. <laughs> So gain like a hundred grams. Oh my gosh. Is that healthy? No. All right, let's read the conclusion. <laughs> Based on the data gathered during this experiment, we can include a positive result in B90X's potential as a muscle growth stimulator. The observed strain on the gastrointestinal tract may also be mitigated by lower dosages or administration of B90X as an injection. The authors have concluded that despite the positive result, B90X is far too aggressive to consider for human testing in the near future. Yeah, I mean, they're gonna get like huge change in their body. <laughs> it's not gonna go well. It does talk about some side effects, which is the gastrointestinal tract, right? And we mm. know that Amelia also has some stomach issues. So there could be a connection there. I don't know. She drank the tea, right? Mm -hmm. And also coffee, but I think the tea. Subject two showed 9.3 increase in mass <laughs> with uh, more than 7% as new muscle tissue. <laughs> like they didn't use steroids, but also revealed severe gastrointestinal ulceration that would have likely proven fatal within days of the trial's conclusion. So not safe at all. It likely could have killed Sandra. Maybe. We, there was no autopsy, because what if, like, they found her with, like, set, uh, <laughs> like, she's got this really buff when she, <laughs> she died. Let's say she weighed, like, 150, then 10%. It's 15 pounds additional, just all muscle. Well, if we see anything like that, we know exactly what happened. There might be autopsy results in the next envelopes. Okay. So again, we are trying to prove that the fire suppression system was not what killed Sandra, but uh, we don't have proof that she somehow ingested this B90X. So uh, let's just move on. Because next we have Colonel Kurt Abrams, who's now suddenly very suspicious. All right, we're just gonna skim through this. He was a guest. He is in the US Air Force and US Space Force. Everything's classified. Kurt is calm and aloof. He is extremely stable and compliant, but may clash with personalities that attempt to exert undue authority. He is well suited to the particular rigors of this mission and should make for an exemplary guest if he is not infringed upon. Okay, and he's uh, pretty fit, even at his age. Medical conditions, allergies, allergic to soy milk, socialists, and MSNBC. Colonel Abrams insisted these items be documented. <laughs> okay, incident report. 
Okay, so this location is green sector, no incident related injuries, yes to casualties, yes to caused by user error, and yes additional training is needed, yes to mechanical defect, yes to critical damage, no to parts being repaired, and yes to replacement parts needed. Systems damage, power grid and batteries and critical, exactly the same as the previous one. Okay, so his statement, I was out on a scheduled EVA, that's a spacewalk, as you civilians like to call it, when the lights on the station went dark. I knew something had gone wrong, so I used my tether to navigate back to the airlock. It's quite difficult without the guiding lights. I could hear some of the chatter between Jordan and Captain Lopez and piece together what happened. When I got back to the airlock, I finally had a free hand to use my own radio and Captain Lopez informed me they could not get me to safety until power was restored. Technically, I was already inside the station, but if Jordan hadn't gotten the power on to repressurize the airlock within the hour, you'd have another dead body on our hands. From inside the airlock, I could see faintly through the hatch into the blue sector hub but it was mostly dark other than the emergency strip lighting. I saw a few flashes of movement when I first got into the place and then a bit more shortly before the evac order was given, but couldn't see much more than that. It seemed like I had been forgotten after the fire was discovered, but all I could do was hang tight where I was. When I overheard that Miss Ivy was unaccounted for, it was clear from the tone that they anticipated the worst. I offered my condolences and meant it, but I didn't want Jordan to get distracted from restoring power to get me back inside. <laughs> I had enough O2 to make do, but it was far from limitless. Once the lights were on, the captain and Jordan set the airlock to repressurize and reoxygenate. It was breathable in about 15 minutes, but I needed to stay in there for closer to 30 before it was safe to leave the airlock. Once I was inside, Captain Lopez informed me that Miss Ivy was confirmed dead and the lab was locked until your arrival. X marks the spot. This is him, I'm assuming. And then he came all the way over here, tethered mm -hmm. to airlock. So the only interesting thing is when he noted people were in the blue, uh, right? Or passing the blue sector. Which doesn't seem like too abnormal because there were people walking back and forth. I'm just wondering because uh, Amelia goes to the green hub, but I guess that's from the red. So she would have went this way. Okay, interviewee, Colonel Kurt Abrams. Colonel Abrams, sir, if I understand correctly, you were not exactly within the station for a majority of the incident. Is that correct? Affirmative. I was on a scheduled spacewalk at the time. Fortunately, I was able to follow my tether back to the airlock, where I remained until roughly 12.30. It seems like you've been on a number of spacewalks since the voyage began, for more than any of the other guests, or even the crew for that matter. Any reason for that? I didn't come all the way up here to sit inside, Mr. Hart. Fair enough, I suppose. And was there a purpose to this spacewalk? You said it was scheduled? I was performing a visual check of whole integrity looking for rips in the thermal blanketing, signs of gas leaks, and so on. Did you have any reason to be concerned about any of that? You want to be proactive about everything you can up here, because anything can become life-threatening. And did you see anything? You mentioned thermal coverings. Could that lead to a problem with the batteries overheating? Ask your engineer. That's not my area of expertise. My apologies for assuming. I was informed that you have a career's worth of experience with the USSF and the Air Force Space Program. What is it you do with the Space Force? Classified. Your entire role with the United States Space Force is classified? Affirmative. Okay then. I didn't know the USSF supported space exploration by the private sector. Can you tell me what brought you to be here on the Delta One? A shuttle. <laughs> Let me rephrase. The USSF has been very vocal in its criticism of Astro Ivy's plans to make space open to the public. Is that a viewpoint you share personally? It's a complex issue. I respect the ambition. Ambition built this country, after all. But I distrust the foresight of a company more worried about profit margins than geopolitical ramifications. Yet here you are on the first station owned and operated by a private company. Tickets weren't cheap either. Care to elaborate on what made you decide to be a part of this mission? No, I would not. Then let's talk strictly about your time at the Astro IV facility in here on the Delta One. I hear there were disagreements about the personal cargo you wanted to bring aboard. More specifically, that you were resistant to provide an inventory when requested. What's so important you have to hide? 
Well, we kind of know already, but... <laughs> I brought my cargo concerns to the authority I was directed to, and we came to an understanding. That's all there is to say. Is it? You really thought a space shuttle would be more lax than the TSA? You know what I think? I think the United States Space Force sent you up here to do more than just a go on spacewalks. An innocent space tourist wouldn't need to hide behind security clearances at every turn. You seem to be forgetting that I was very nearly the second victim of this mess. This entire situation reeks of corporate overreach, cutting corners wherever they can and sending a bunch of wet behind the ear civilians up here to play astronaut with untested technology. And yet someone paid through the nose to get you here knowing all of that. Why? Regardless of the USSF's feelings, this is still a historical moment for humanity and the American people, one that I am sad to see go down in infamy. Is that so? Because based on what I know about the USSF's public statements, this tragedy is exactly the political leverage they need to solidify their hold on regulating private space exploration. Some might consider that an acceptable loss. Do you disagree? I disagree that the USSF would ever want to see an American citizen die in pursuit of the American dream. If the Delta I had been under the USSF's oversight from the start, we'd have one fewer death on our hands right now. There was already a USSF colonel up here when Sandra died, and he was just another liability. You can't even provide a single clue that might help me with this investigation. Did you at least get a look into the lab or see anything at all that might help? I did not. And you're sure you know what you were looking at? Excuse me? You mentioned the Delta I was untested technology. I'm just asking if maybe it was outside of your training with the USSF. The Delta I is state of the art after all. Even some of the newest ISS modules are what, 10, 15 years old? Astro IV made some impressive innovations, but it's hardly more than an iteration on what's been built and paid for by taxpayer dollars. And now Astro IV slaps their logo on it and calls it proprietary. Their goal is to expand humanity's horizon insofar as it expands their own pocketbooks. Zelik, maybe, not Sandra. She deserved better than what she got from this trip. At least we can agree on that. How did you get here? A shuttle. A shuttle. <laughs> <laughs> Next, we have a letter from the United States Space Force. Dear Solomon Hart, Thank you for your inquiry regarding Colonel Abrams work as an officer of the United States Space Force. This letter serves as an official record that your request has been denied. <laughs> and that you have been formally asked to discontinue any additional lines of inquiry into this specific subject matter. I have taken the liberty of writing you personally in order to dissuade any further attempts to pry into the classified materials. If you had any notion to escalate up the chain of command, rest assured you have reached its pinnacle. I can confirm that Colonel Abrams had departed from the Delta I with the full leave of the USSF. As one of our best and brightest, Astro IV should be grateful for the immeasurable asset of his presence aboard their station. Regarding his professional motivations to attend this mission or the personal cargo he carried with him, you are more than welcome to take that up with the colonel himself. He is well aware of what he is authorized to share with a civilian, and I expect you to respect that he is within his rights and his duty to withhold classified information. I commend your dedication and thorough examination, but I assure you that the details of Colonel Abrams' record are well outside the scope of whatever incident you are investigating. I consider it my personal fortune to have served with Colonel Abrams on multiple occasions against multiple enemies, and I assure you that the man and his work are beyond reproach. To be absolutely clear, the USSF will not tolerate any allegations of non-cooperation, nor the attempts to besmirch the good name of one of our own. Any further attempts to attain this information without sound grounds for declassification will be met by the full litigious force of the USSF. Sincerely, General Jerome P. Levitt. Litigious force. All right. Well, I mean, we know why they're so defensive and secretive. I still can't answer uh, objective two. I still now don't know. <sighs> Have you noticed this entire reading? That one picture allowed us to answer objective one. That's how it always is in this uh, game. Okay, last one. So we have AJ Singh, spiritual guidance. He can speak Hindu, Urdu, Bengali, and English. His clearance level is crew. Let's just read his psychological profile. AJ is charismatic and emphatic by nature. His score suggests that he is ideally suited for prolonged occupancy on an orbital vessel. He displays excellent conflict prevention and seems comfortable in both isolation and close quarters with other personalities. However, his knowledge of human psychology and profiling acumen may render traditional profiling methods ineffective. And then... So basically, we can't read him? 
Oh, is that what that means? Like he's hard to read? Or he can easily... Trick the system or something. Yeah. His physical profile seems decent. Medical conditions, he didn't write anything. No medical records. Claims never to have been treated by a certified medical practi practitioner. It's that uh, tea, that herbal tea, you know? <laughs> okay, so let's see. Location, batteries. No to incident-related injuries. Yes to incident-related related casualties. Yes to user error. No to additional training. Yes to mechanical defect. No to critical damage. No to parts repaired. And yes to replacement parts needed. Systems damage is power grid life support, batteries, air filtration, and thermal controls. Very similar to Amelia and critical. His statement says, I was in the observatory meditating at the time of the blackout. I had the lights out and my radio off to eliminate distraction. As such, I was unaware of the exact moment it all began. I recall feeling a shift in the station's aura. I did my best to ignore it and remain empty, but the sensation soon grew too powerful to ignore. I made my way to the red hub just as Amelia came floating in from the hallway. She was vibrating with anger. I looked to her for clarity on what had befallen the station, but she was intent on finding Hero, who entered the hub from habitation soon after. Wait, from habitation? Yeah, he was in his room and went oh, out okay. to the red hub. The tension between them was palpable. I felt an eruption looming just as Jordan's voice broke through on the radio calling for an evacuation of the green sector. Amelia rushed off, leaving Hero and I behind to wait. She soon returned asking for Sandra, Amelia's anger now overtaken by alarm. We searched the habitation and recreation modules urgently but found nothing. We remained hopeful but now I know the sensation I felt was Sandra's path reaching the terminus. There is nothing to mourn. We need only to witness the divine will of the universe. Oh my gosh. I thought I would find like more holes and statements, but nothing is sticking out to me. It's all pretty consistent. So the interviewee is AJ Singh. AJ, I understand that you only began working with Sandra recently. Is that correct? Yes. In relative terms, that is so. Quite recently, I'd say, given that the two of us never crossed paths, for someone who has only known Sandra a few months, you seem to have made yourself indispensable, important enough to secure a multi-million dollar ticket to space. Any insight you could provide on that? Are you at all spiritual, investigator? I'd like to stay on topic, please. Ah, of course. And you've answered my question well enough. It is my opinion that we live day to day in varying degrees of separation from where we are meant to be at any given time. However, when one does find that sacred alignment, it is breathtaking, undeniable to all who witness it, and even more so to those who experience it. I'd prefer something a little more concrete, if you don't mind. What service did you provide to the CEO of Astro Ivy? I helped Sandra see the signposts leading down her sacred path. I apologize if it is not concrete enough, but I'm afraid that is the nature of my service. Most notably, perhaps, I helped her to see Hiro Sasaki as an ally in waiting, where she saw a boulder in her path. I helped her see a mountain that needed only to be climbed to new heights. And what heights they are, do you not agree? I noticed Sandra's address on your Astro IV paperwork. You don't have your own residence back on Earth? I do, but Sandra invited me to live in her guest house. I assure you it was nothing scandalous. A guide cannot simply call down from the mountaintop. He must meet the wanderer wherever they are in their journey. I, of course, offered to let her come live with me and my students, but we both knew it was a pale offer to a person of her ambition. You mentioned other students. It seems to me that you couldn't have much time for followers, or students rather, given how exclusively you seem to have connected yourself to Sandra. When you keep an eye on your own path, it is easy enough to see who is walking in your direction and who is not. I found myself inexplicably drawn to Sandra and her particular journey. I too felt it to be uncanny, though I suppose it has all become clear now. How's that? I mentioned that feeling of being in harmony, of being where one is meant to be, yes? 
It is my belief now that it was because her tragic end was so close that both Sandra and myself felt that urgency. There were steps she needed to take down her path, and unknown to the both of us, she did not have long to get there. Uh huh. And where exactly were you during the blackout? I was in the observatory meditating for most of the event. It was only when I found myself unable to focus that I knew something was amiss. My breathing felt suddenly shallow. No matter how much I focused on drawing out each breath, it was only after several minutes of struggling that I relented my practice to investigate. And what did you do then? After ditching your quest of self-discovery, I mean. I was alarmed to find the lights were not responding, and felt my way to the red hub. I had only just begun to get my bearings when I heard Amelia calling for Hero. And what did you do after talking to Amelia? Amelia had little time to talk to me before we all heard Jordan's call to evacuate the green sector. Amelia then pushed past me to rush in the direction of the green sector, leaving Hero and I alone in the red hub. And what did you do after she left? Hero and I were left to wait mostly. Hero was unsettled. His eyes darted about anxiously, and he looked like he wanted to go help Jordan in the blue sector. But ultimately, he never committed to any course of action. Amelia returned minutes later and asked if we had seen Sandra. And what then? We checked the rest of the rooms in habitation and recreation before Amelia called Jordan to ask if Sandra had been seen in the blue sector. By this point, Amelia had found Sandra's radio in her room, but we remained hopeful. But alas, this journey was destined to be her last. Was it all this talk about being in the right place in alignment, and yet none of you even thought to look for Sandra until after she was already stuck in a death trap? I understand your frustration, Mr. Saul. I feel the same loss as you do. But if this was the culmination of Sandra's sacred path, it was not up to me to stop it, nor Amelia. Nor was it up to you. It will take time, but I hope you eventually find comfort in that. She is the CEO of the multi-billion-dollar company that put this modern miracle in the sky, and yet she seems to be the last thing on anyone's mind. You are trying to find someone to blame. It is your stated purpose for being here, but I can assure you that finding someone at fault will not bring Sandra back, nor will it relieve your own guilt for not being here to save her. Only you can release that. I would be happy to lead you in some healing breath work. I think we're done here. Okay. And the final document. If this is how he meditates with one eye open, then he should have known that the lights were off. Even when your lights, when your lights are on and your eyes are closed, you know when the lights turn off. The Houstonian Times. New guru on the block. Yogi breathes new life into Houston's midtown. Today we sit down with AJ Singh, developer of the Deep Self Method, or called DSM, at his new studio in Midtown. DSM is a yoga and meditation ritual that's taking the Houston health and wellness scene by storm. Guru AJ recently made his way to Houston from New York, but before that, he spent most of his life in the remote Himalayas. In India, I gained the title of Swami Singh Guru, but I don't go by that here unless it's a book signing. He says with a laugh. Which is precisely why I renounce it. The Swami belongs in India. It is a path of AJ Singh I followed across the ocean. For those in the know, the Deep Self Method achieved near mythical status as New York City's best kept secret. Singh's first studio was a nondescript apartment in Greenwich Village. The clientele was limited, and membership was a closely guarded secret even before his autobiography hit the bestsellers list. Those lucky enough to become a student would spend weeks under the private tutelage of Singh himself. When asked about the exclusivity of his practice, AJ had this to say: "A life's path is always individual, and as such, it is a criminal act to attempt to herd many down a singular road." You will only cause them to lose their way. I am a guide, not a teacher, so I do not hold classes one-on-one -on -one or couples only. Taking so few students means that Singh has to be particularly selective about those he guides, and he is notorious for turning away some of the most prestigious clients who come to his door. AJ says that there's no rubric for selecting his clients. Instead, he chooses those he thinks he can help the most. When you keep an eye on your own path. It is easy enough to see who is walking in your direction and who is not. 
One such person is Houston's own Sandra Ivey, the starbound luminary and CEO of Astro Ivy. In between test flights and planning for the official opening of the Delta One space station later this year, Sandra has been spotted more than once coming out of AJ's new studio. Many of us would be starstruck going toe to toe with an international celebrity, but AJ is no stranger to high profile students. Even the most exceptional person is still a person. Moreover, those dedicated to excellence are often the most open to self-improvement. I think that is why I found such success with VIPs such as Sandra. Despite being guru to the stars, AJ still insists that all clients will be considered while he still has time slots open. So stop by soon before they fill up. All right. Nothing about his tea. Hmm. Oh no. So, I mean, my hunch is the B90X, but we don't have proof that she ingested it somehow. Where's that report? How long did it take for it? Did it say that it would affect the rats? And maybe we should focus on these new documents too. So newspaper, I think this is important because it has Levitt's name here. And it mentions like the motive to have these space marshals, right? This, we just know that that was their objective was to have these tests. Wait, but why would killing her help with their space force marshal? I don't think they wanted to kill her. I just think, I don't know. It was that, it was still an accident. Hmm. I don't know. Cause yeah, what would be the motive that wouldn't that wouldn't benefit the Colonel or the Space Force. But remember, in these games, don't need to focus on motive. <laughs> you just need to catch that, aha, that's it. Nothing's connecting for me because we know that there's a discrepancy with the battery instruction. And now we're being led to, because the battery um, explosion is a distraction. But then we know something about this B90X, but I'm assuming it has to be ingested, right? But then we know nothing about Sandra, time frame, dietary, did she drink anything, eat anything? Yeah, we have no info on Sandra's like actions or whereabouts that day. Aside that she was seen 30 minutes prior to 11 o'clock or when the, the process started. Yeah, so here it said that the rat would have likely died within days. So does that mean that she could have ingested it prior to the trip? Well, we're trying to prove that the death was not caused by the suppression system. She was already dead before the air was taken out. So she could have been in the uh, lab. And what was she doing in the lab? I mean, I don't know. We have zero info on what she was doing there. I'm pretty open to taking a hint now because we went through all the documents. So it says prove the fire suppression system didn't kill Sandra. Sandra wasn't killed by the fire suppression system. Can you find the two items that prove it? So before we can get a hint, I guess we can just make an educated guess. Okay, so you think it has to do with B90X? Yeah. Would it be the results? I really think somehow it's connected to the T, but there's no connection between the T and B90X. I think we should look at the photos again. You know the photo where she's floating? You know how sometimes you might think, oh, is there an injection? I don't know. Like a syringe floating? Oh, I see something. Hmm. Right here is a code. And it, wasn't there a page with uh, some codes or something? Or the cargo or something. Okay. Or the dietary stuff. It's three letters or two letters, followed by four numbers. It's no, it's 806.hw. Oh, okay. Wait, 806, I read that in the, the space station, space force, what is it, or the, B90X. M H. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's just upside down. Yeah. Ah, so it's in there. Yeah, I remember reading it in this one. So there's MH908. Yeah, so the problem is, I was looking at when you look at it this way, and I'll show you guys a, a screenshot of this. It looks like 806 HW. But when you look at it the other way around, it is MH908. So it's not really hidden well. 
because they needed to keep it in an open space, right? I mean, that still doesn't explain how she died. Yeah, how can you ingest it? Is it only by ingestion? It is, right? Water was made freely available to each subject. Separate food supply that was blended with B90X, so you do have to ingest it. It says gastrointestinal could be also administered by injection. I don't know. Okay, I think my educated guess would be this photo and this document. Yeah. Or, oh no, no, not this one. Um, not this one. This one, yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's go for I it. agree. So CSI photo, yes, in science lab. And is it Operation Mighty Mouse? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Operation Mighty mm -hmm. Mouse. Go ahead. Oh. Oh, more questions. Question two, please confirm you understand the evidence fully by answering the question below. Which mouse fact is needed to solve the objective? The cage needed to be open, yeah. right? Air to breathe. Yeah. Wait, shelter to be, uh, I see water to drink. Yeah, air to breathe. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yay. If there wasn't any oxygen in the lab, the mice would have suffocated too. Wait, what does that prove? <laughs> what? <laughs> Congratulations, you just proved Sandra Ivy was murdered. We did? What? Okay, the mice, the mice from Kurt's experiment were in the lab with Sandra when she died. Yes, we saw that. Mice breathe oxygen and they survived, proving the lab was never flushed of oxygen. Oh, did they? I don't even know that they survived. Did we f know that? Yeah, I don't know. Oh, is this is this results from like this experiment in the Delta One? This is after arriving back on Earth. Oh, I guess oh, so. Oh, okay, yeah. So they didn't die. So, so basically, because the rat survived, we know that she also had oxygen. But she died of suffocation, or did they just assume that? They assume that. Where's the autopsy? I don't know. <laughs> this all could have been solved with an autopsy. No, they need us as investigators. <laughs> they need to waste our time. <laughs> okay, so. All right, let's open the next envelope. Oh my gosh. See, I told you, we just find something in the picture and then it'll help us solve the next one. I think it was dumb luck, but it was your uh, call to look at this picture, so good call. A key to anyone who's playing this game, when you're looking at the photos, something will look photoshopped, and that's why you can tell. Well, another thing, just don't read anything, just look at the photos. That's just kidding. Too. Yeah, that's you. Just kidding. It's funny too that we figured it out, but we didn't necessarily know like why. That was just our educated guess and ended up being right. <laughs> All right, here's bonus envelope B. Okay, objective number three. Who killed Sandra? The rats did. <laughs> Another letter. You did it. There's no way around it. If Kurt's mice survived in the science lab, there must have been air to breathe. The fire suppression system didn't kill Sandra. I have a few friends at Astro Ivy who still take my calls, so I ran all this by Raj Mandal. He confirmed that the AFS system only removes oxygen in rooms where smoke is detected. So if the lab door was closed before the battery began smoking, the lab would have not been flushed of oxygen. Sandra was trapped in there, but there was plenty of air to breathe. When Sandra was found suffocated so close to the fire, everyone assumed the lab was flushed along with the hub. It was the most logical conclusion, and with no evidence to the contrary, we all fell for it. But your discovery with these mice proves that didn't happen. It took an outsider to see what all the experts were blind to. I think there's a lesson here. Now that we're one step closer to figuring out who orchestrated the Delta One tragedy, I'm excited to tell you about a new lead I just stumbled upon. Sandra's laptop was in the lab with her when she died. The battery was dead, but I took it back to Earth and handed it over to Zelik. I told him we should have forensic technicians conduct a thorough analysis back then, but Raj let it slip that it's been in storage ever since. Raj is no rule breaker, but he's not my only friend at Astro IV. And fortunately, another one owed me a favor. After she snuck Sandra's laptop out to me, I took it to a private digital forensics expert to see what we could get. And well, I think you're just going to have to read it yourself. 
there may be a way to find out exactly what happened to Sandra that morning, and it may even come from Sandra herself. Let's keep digging, Solomon Hart. Ooh. So you were right. She did still die from suffocation. Digital Evidence Forensics Report. Cybercrime Consulting Group, Inc. So the client is Solomon Hart Security. Work summary. Analysis of retrieved laptop. Device dead on delivery. Present in suspected foul play incident. Documented as 8 10, 21, approximately 11 to 12 CDT. High sensitivity. Client, SH, requested that we unlock the computer and if that is not possible, run a complete diagnostic analysis on the hardware. So it was a MacBook Pro, SDXC card slot, HDMI port, blah, 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 Astro IV decal, four velcro strips taped on bottom, presumably it's secure in zero G. All right, is there a backside? Let's see. Can't really read it. Wait. All right, let's go to the back. Unlock device, fail. We were unable to unlock the device. Admin account, SIV at astroiv.com, no password provided. Active encryption on startup disk, halted attempts to brute force and unlock. System set for automatic memory erasure in the event of three failed passwords in an hour. Uh-oh. USB-C port scan results. Since laptop could not be unlocked, forensic analysis was limited to information collected through the USB-C port using proprietary scanning software. The scan results were typical for a device of this usage, except these findings that may be relevant to your investigation. Key findings. The hard drive was cloned on August 10th, 2021. Metadata analysis of the hard drive indicates that 100% of the files on this computer were last accessed on August 10th, 2021. So I think this was the kernel, right? One of his missions was to get data also on the Delta One, right? Mm. Audio was recording during the Delta One tragedy. We were able to determine the laptop's built-in microphone was actively recording audio on August 10th, 2021 from 11.08 to 11.11. Huh, why that time frame? Audio files are likely stored on Astro IV's cloud services. Despite regular microphone activation, no audio files were found on the hard drive. We suspect they were automatically syncing to her Astro IV account. Interesting, interesting. Forensic examiner's conclusion. It is the forensic examiner's opinion that someone aboard the Delta One spacecraft cloned the contents of this computer within the time frame that Sandra Ivy was killed. Miss Ivy appears to have been recording audio around the same time. No audio files are saved to this computer's hard drive. If those files exist, my guess is that they are somewhere in the cloud. You start by IT or it goes to this website. Okay. Let's go to the site. Are we gonna have to figure out a password? Uh, this browser is not suited for my iPad. Astro IV, outer space is waiting for you. Book my trip. We are opening G space. I'm just kidding. <laughs> we are opening space to everyone, including you. Astro IV is dedicated to making space a destination open to everyone. Join us for a two week getaway in low Earth orbit on one of our Delta series space stations. Astro IV hopes to increase investment both personally and publicly in making space technology more affordable and reliable to produce. In the the spirit of that mission, we also offer fully funded scholarship flights for promising students and researchers who could benefit from access to our cutting edge microgravity modules. Let's just look for this uh, audio file. <laughs> How can we do that? Log in? Oh, there's a video. Oh man, okay. We're supposed to be paying attention. <laughs> I think login. Login. Ah. <sighs> what would we do for God password? Oh yeah. Okay. So, so it's it? S I V uh -huh. at Astro I V. Enter your email. Okay. Address. All right. We're just trying with her email. Oh, okay. Yeah. Security questions. She went to Rice. It says, what college did you attend? Just put Rice? Yeah, let's see. Or you could put Rice University. Mm, maybe just Rice. Okay. 
All right, <laughs> move on. What street did you grow up on? Oh, wait, is it, is it her brother mentioned something? I don't remember that. It was the interview? Oh, oh, oh no, 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 the her guru, mom. the guru's uh, address. He was, he wrote her address on his uh, Oh yeah, I was gonna file. say also his parents. Gemini Drive. Okay, so do I just write Gemini? Uh, sure. Oh no. Okay, I get it. Wait, did you grow up on? Are you sure it's not the parent one? Okay. Oh, you're right, you're right. This is her house, right? Right? Yeah, so he was still in her parents' house. The brother, right? Yeah, Jemison. But I don't know if this is his new house. No, he bought it, remember? Yeah, but what street did she they grow up on? Well, if he moved oh, back he in moved with his mom yeah, yeah, yeah. and then bought the house. I see. Yeah, that's right. Oh no, what is your favorite book? Oh, the, the Guru's book. <laughs> what is it called? I don't know, something about the book signing, right? Are you sure it's the it's not deep self method? You could that's, try it. That's a method though. Was it the letter from the doctor who was like summarizing everything? Oh no, it just says Sandra found his book and started attending his practice, but it doesn't show the name of the book. What was the one that described how he became the personal advisor? This one. Oh, okay, never mind. Let's see, a week later she hired AJ directly and bought 500 copies of his book, but there's no name. Oh, hold on. This is where the list of books come in handy. Ah, it was a bestseller, right? Scan for his name. What's his name again? Ajay Singh. Swami Singh Guru, breathtaking. Ah, breathtaking. Oh, right, that was his name when he was in India, right? Is it with an E or just? No, that's breathtaking. Then he said, Do you want breathtaking? Do you want to practice t uh, techniques or whatever to Solomon? Yes, identified. Okay, let us look for files. Go ahead. Ooh, click to complete processing. Okay, go ahead. It looks like I shouldn't click that. It looks like spam. <laughs> there it is. Click here to retry. All right, here we go. Uploaded at 10.38 a.m. Interesting. Captain's log, stardate August 10th, 2021. Day 10 of Delta One trip. And hey, <laughs> nobody's killed each other. Not yet. <laughs> we'll see if Hero and Jordan make it out alive after working together. Speaking of working together, I'm kind of surprised these cyber attacks haven't lightened up since we joined forces with Sasaki. Raj sent me this spreadsheet of all the attacks with times, location, and any other details he could find out, but I'm not seeing any patterns yet. Wait, what's this? A bunch of these are from inside the company. Why didn't this get flagged? Hmm, oh, well, that's why no one said anything. These are all from my old laptop, which I haven't touched since I upgraded in January. Where did I? It's at the guest house. Oh boy, I gotta reach out to Saul. He'll know what to do. What happened to the lights? Ooh, this is not good. Where's my radio? Jeez, you scared me. How long have you been here? Um, we should, uh, all head back to Blue Sector. I just need a second to, uh, what are you? Stop! intense all right so the breaches were from her old laptop in her guest house and you know who was staying there uh, aj 
However, this person has to have enough strength to overtake her. And we know that AJ scored the lowest on strength. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's definitely a man, or at least someone with a deep voice. <laughs> I don't know. So we have four males. Hmm. So I think the biggest lead is about the old laptop at the guest house being responsible for all these security breaches. So if it's AJ who's staying at the guest house, why would he want to kill Sandra? I thought we don't care about motive. Well, we don't. <laughs> oh man. Okay, let's just go to the site then and see what they're asking for. Or maybe her brother went to her place. Could have. The guest house though? Who killed Sandra? Have you found the smoking gun that proves who killed Sandra? Answer the question below to prove it. Where did Sandra leave her old laptop? In her guest house. Who killed Sandra? I guess. That's it? I guess we have to put AJ or AJ. Okay. Uh, yeah. All right. There's no connection. I All can right, think hold on, hold on. Let's not put that yet then. And he's the lowest in strength. I don't understand. Who would have been able to hack in, right? We have Hero, who's obviously would, would be able to do that. And then the military guy. The only thing I know is about this guest house and who would be there. There's okay. no other information. Sure. Let's go for it. You press it. Yes! So weak, what is the motive? This is where we learned the motive. That information about the guest house was in the very last envelope and none of this mattered. Okay. Well, we did know that he was in the guest house early on. Okay, sure. All right, so there's a video, but under this, it's basically what we saw to answer those questions. Good thing you saw that I remembered in the newspaper because that would have taken us a while to realize that. All right, let's watch this video. And we have breaking news for you at this hour in the 2021 murder of Astro Ivy founder Sandra Ivy. As you might recall, Ms. Ivy died while aboard the Delta One space station on August 10th, 2021. Authorities believed her death was an accident until today when a team of investigators discovered a hidden audio recording of Ivy's murder. Authorities now say she was killed by A.J. Segretti, who posed as spiritual counselor A.J. Singh to steal company secrets from Astro IV. Sandra IV discovered Segretti's scheme and the con man covered it up by murdering her. Oregon police apprehended Segretti, and they tell us he confessed to orchestrating the entire Delta One disaster. Right now, he's being charged with first-degree murder and multiple other charges as well. According to officials, Segretti will never see the outside of a prison cell again. He's a con man now. <laughs> you should uh, roll back the, the recording. Did I not say? Oh yeah, he's the he's the killer. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> so funny. All right, let's open up the last envelope. All right, here is bonus envelope C. Yay, ten dollars off. Congratulations, detective. You solved the Sandra Ivy case. And we have the photo that was in the video. And here is his voluntary confession. So here's screenshots of the letter. If you guys want to read it, you can go ahead and pause, but that will do it for this video. We solved the case. I think we're kind of getting better at unsolved case files, knowing what to look for. Hopefully you guys are too. And if you enjoyed the video, don't forget to give us a like, subscribe to our channel, and we hope to see you in the next one.